sir. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Treyon White, senior ward a council member and chair on the Committee on Recreation, Library, and Youth Affairs. Today is Thursday, April the 13th, 2023. We are meeting remotely using the Zoom platform. The time is now 12.21 p.m. I'm calling to order this budget oversight here on the com committee for the DC Public Library System. The DC Public Library was created in 1896 by Act of Congress and established as an independent agency that would serve as the People's University. The DC Public Library supports residents with services, programming, books and other library materials that align with the library's Know Your Neighborhood strategic plan, which encourages libraries to be customized, which allows libraries to customize their service to reflect the unique communities that they serve to include an emphasis on advancing equity amongst all, among all residents, especially among those who are limited or completely without access to a DC Public Library resource. This is accomplished by prioritizing reading, digital citizenship, strong communities, and local history and culture. As I call the first panel of witnesses, uh, we want to question you stick to your time allotted because we are uh, on a time schedule. Um, we also want to note that advisory neighborhood commissioners will be given uh, five minutes if they need to. Um, and we're going to go jump right into it. We will start with uh, ANC Commissioner 8F01, Nick Wilson. Uh, Commissioner 7D09, Ashley Shapato. Let me know if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I want to get it right. Uh, ANC uh, 6B03, David Show. A 6B04, Francis DeAndrea. 6B05, Casey Durkett. 6B07, Vince Moreno. 4802, Joanne Hoyt. And 4801, uh, Paula Edwards. We're going to start right there. Let's see who here. All right. Nick Wilson, AF01. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, council, Councilman. I uh, really appreciate you having me today. Yeah. Uh, and want to thank you just uh, for your service and everything. Uh, for the everyone listening, my name is Nick Wilson. I am the Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner for the Single Member District 8F01. I represent the Northeast portion of Navy Yard from 3rd Street Southeast all the way to 11th Street going west to east and from Virginia Avenue going down to the Anacostia River. Uh, I do plan on being brief today. I, I'm here to voice my support for placing an, an interim uh, library at the Arthur Caper Center, Recreational Center that is in my district. Uh, and. Uh, we would like that to be placed there while a more permanent space is, is getting renovated over the next couple of years. So I don't have to tell you about uh, my district and my ANC. Navy Yard is the fastest growing uh, neighborhood in the District of Columbia. It's been cited uh, as among the best neighborhoods in the country by Forbes Magazine, as you know. Uh, we boast the uh, United States Department of Transportation headquarters. We have two military facilities. Uh, most districts don't have one, we have two. We have multiple city facilities and innumerable number of commercial sites. And of course, the baseball field. My SMD itself, it boasts uh, mixed income uh, communities. We have everything from DC housing authority families. We have affordable housing families and we have market, market value homes uh, that all uh, get mixed in and we, we live together. It's an experiment that has worked over the past more than a decade. It, it continues to work. 
And while we have many things in this ANC and this district, one of the things we, we don't have access to is a walkable library for our children to grow and to continue to learn. So I don't have to cite to you the, the numerous studies that show the impact that, that reading has on, on children, especially those under the age of five. Uh, children who read early, at an earlier age, they're more likely to, to finish high school and go on to college. They're more likely to have access to better paying jobs and come back to the communities and improve those communities. Also don't have to cite the, the, the varying uh, literacy rates from uh, those in our ward and across, versus those across uh, other parts of, of the district. Placing the interim library in this SMD will encourage the, the reading of, of, of the small children that are in this ward and, and in my district and uh, give them access uh, uh, to opportunities for a better chance at life, which reading does for all children. I know that there are libraries uh, within maybe a 30 minute walk from, from where we live, but those of us with small children or who have had small children in the past, we know how difficult it can be to, to walk your children in the blistering cold of the winter or the smoldering heat of the summer, especially these DC summers. We know that that's not, not, not really the, the best case scenario adding the library in our, our SMD would, would certainly help and encourage more children to go to the library, more, more reading and all of the things that I said before. Uh, and finally, I, I just, again, I promise you I'd be brief. I know my fellow ANCs will have more to say on this topic, but I did just wanna conclude and leave you with the fact that I do support the placement of the interim library in, in our district at the Arthur Caper Center. And I stand with my fellow ANCs and testifying today. So thank you, sir. That's all I have. Great. Uh, thank you. Give me one second. And forgive me for being late this afternoon, having some technical difficulties with my computer. Um, but nonetheless, we are here. Um, I want to make sure we respect everyone's time, especially those who took time out of their day to testify. Next, we will have Ashley Shapto. Shapto, yes, thank you. All right. Thank you, Council Member. My name is Ashley Shapito, Commissioner for 709 in Hill East. The DC Public Library System is one of our city's crown jewels. It's a vital public good that serves our community in ways far beyond books, although we all know the benefits of access to books for children at a particularly young age. From providing internet service to tax help to COVID tests during the pandemic, the library system fills societal gaps and addresses vital needs of our neighbors. I strongly urge the DCPL to provide interim services during the renovation of the Southeast Library. The Northeast Branch is about a 27 minute walk from my home compared to the 15 minute walk to the Southeast Branch and a four minute Metro ride given its accessibility on the um, orange, silver and blue lines. I'm also concerned that little outreach was done to Commission 7D this year compared to 6B about the closure and lack of interim services. After redistricting, 7D comprises all of Hill East including from East Capitol to Congressional Cemetery, an area that relies on the Southeast Library. Redirecting this entire community to the Northeast Library does not meet our needs. I'd also like to share a letter from a fellow Hill East resident. As a resident of Hill East, I'm deeply concerned about the effect of the upcoming Southeast Library closure on our community. DC libraries fill in the gaps where existing public services fall short, providing assistance with tax forms, citizenship applications, finding employment, learning the English language, and more. The library's classes and activities allow children to learn and grow and give parents a mental reprieve while knowing their children are well supervised. Older kids and teens can also spend time in libraries after school to work on homework and avoid negative influences. And libraries offer a safe and comfortable place for people experiencing homelessness, often the only comfortable place that does not require a purchase, lest you face a charge of loitering. This, of course, is in addition to the usual business of lending books. I applaud the needed renovation and improvements to the Southeast Library, but interim arrangements must be made. 
The Northeast and Southwest libraries alone leave a large swath of the community underserved. We thank you for your consideration in Hill East. Thank you, Council Member White. Thank you. Next, we have David Sobisho. And correct me with your name, please. And forgive me, uh, Ms. Ashley. Go ahead. Chairman White, thank you. Uh, staff, neighbors, and friends, I'm David Sobelson, Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner for a ANC-6B. Three of my colleagues are joining me on this panel from 6B. On April 11th, our ANC voted unanimously to authorize us to represent the ANC at this hearing. Though ANC-6B is in Ward 6, our library is also the closest for many residents of Ward 7 and 8. Maybe that's why Ward 6 libraries have the second most visitors of any ward in the city. Later this year, the Southeast Library will close for renovations. It will stay closed for at least two years. DC Library guidelines claim that DCPL will look to provide an interim facility when a library will be closed for longer than one year. But from the start, library representatives hid their intentions. In several community meetings, they seldom mentioned an interim facility. When we asked, they assured us they'd follow their guidelines. From a meeting in January 2019, quote, we are committed to providing some kind of interim services. From July 2020, quote, services will continue in the immediate area of the Southeast Neighborhood Library building. From this past September, quote, we're working diligently to find a destination to pick up books. Yet the library system still refuses to commit to a place to pick up or drop off books, to provide computers to access the internet, find a job, or even check the library catalog, or to provide a printer, scanner, or copier. Council member Anita Bonds has suggested a bookmobile. We'd take it. Thanks to Barracks Row Main Street, we did find a place for a weekly kids story time program. Is that what library representatives meant by some kind of interim services? In January, our ANC set up a Southeast Library Task Force, which I chair. Yet Library Director Richard Reyes Gavilan refuses to meet with us. No one from the library will tell us what it's done to arrange crucial interim services. Recently, the Foggy Bottom and Southwest branches closed for no longer than our branch will close. Foggy Bottom got interim space in the Watergate. Southwest got a trailer at 4th and I. Southeast deserves as much as Southwest and Foggy Bottom. We've identified potential locations for interim services, locations that perhaps would cost less than a suite at the Watergate. If council needs more funds for an interim facility, We've even identified potential additional funding sources. Instead, library management tells us to walk to the Northeast branch. According to Google directions, the Northeast branch is 0.9 miles from the Southeast branch. Able-bodied adults take 20 minutes to walk one mile. Older adults take longer. So do parents traveling with children, as you've already heard. But even that doesn't tell the full story. For people towards our East and South, especially public housing residents, in Hopkins Apartments, Potomac Gardens, and Kentucky Courts, the Northeast Branch is well over a mile. For some residents, it's closer to two miles. Again, this is from Google Directions. These kids deserve interim library services closer than a 30 or 40 minute walk. So do their parents. Most adults I see at Southeast use computers to hunt for jobs. Our government should help them too, not just those in Foggy Bottom. Our government should also respect seniors and other residents with limited mobility. What will the library tell people with disabilities? Roll your chair to Northeast? At least Southeast has the nearby Metro Rail Station. Northeast has neither adequate public transit nor designated parking. Library management has even promised increased services in Northeast, like more computers. Maybe management will claim that despite their guidelines, only neighborhoods that get what the library calls a new build get an interim library. Southwest had a new build, so Southwest got an interim library but it shouldn't matter how library management pigeonholes a project. Instead, as the guidelines indicate, it should matter how long the branch will stay closed. Southwest's branch closed for two years. Our branch will close at least that long. And our branch will experience close to a new build. The interior will be almost fully gutted. It will cost far more than Southwest's new library. The architect himself calls it new construction. Maybe Southwest got an interim library because they were better organized but even they struggled for years against the library system's opposition. Do it yourself, they were told. It seems that when DCPL plans to close a library for over a year, 
They'll provide an interim library, but only for a well-organized community that exerts political pressure. The library system has consistently disregarded its own guidelines. That must stop. The council should appropriate funds for an interim library facility for Southeast. To quote a resident from that very first community meeting, quote, you can't just close our library and tell us to go downtown or to Northeast. We use the building here and we still need services here. You're just coming in here making decisions without considering us and our needs, close quote. I would be happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Francis DeAndrea. Thank you, Chairperson White. Thank you for having us here today to testify. My name is Francis DeAndrea, and I'm the Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner for SMD 6B04. At a duly noticed meeting of ANC 6B with the quorum present, we voted unanimously for me and my fellow 6B commissioners pre to present here today and to provide our testimony. Commissioner Sobelson laid out a fairly comprehensive case, so I, not, I do not think bears repeating in full. I would like to emphasize a few points, however. The first is one of equity. While there is much affluence in the area surrounding the Southeast Library, there are also several DC housing authority complexes located nearby, Potomac Gardens, Hopkins, and Kentucky Courts. While we unfortunately cannot get a resident of those complexes to attend today's hearing, they will certainly be impacted by the lack of core interim services nearby. It is well documented that libraries provide vital services for low income populations, including access to computers and printers when they might not have access to those at their residences. These locations are mainly south and east of the library. This brings me to my second point, travel times. Suppose that the Northeast Library will be the location for interim services while the Southeast Library undergoes renovations. Well, those in the very north of my SMD and 6B in general may be minimally impacted. In areas south of Pennsylvania Avenue and east of 12th Street Southeast, the travel times increases dramatically. This fact means that increased travel times will impact the populations most in need of the library services noted above. The differences in walking time at this far southeast corner of 6B to the southeast and northeast library respectively is over 10 minutes, approximately 19 versus 31 minutes. Public transportation is an option, but involves either transferring to another bus and then walking a few blocks east or getting off near the existing Southeast Library at 7th Street and walking a further 15 minutes. That's not to mention all those in 7D or 8F. We have slight, similar or slightly increased travel times. Even if the travel times are more reasonable, this brings me to my third point, consistency in communication. Other library renovations, the Southwest and West End Library come to mind, had core interim services provided. These were not fancy, large or extensive, but they did the job of providing basic functions such as book pickup and drop off computers and printers. These interim facilities were located near the existing libraries, relieving the hardships of many to travel significantly increased distances. While small, they were undoubtedly impactful. We're not asking for more or less, just the same treatment they received. We also asked for improved communication from the library system. I can't personally speak to what outreach was done before, it is clear that there have been some crossed wires and miscommunications and that a reset of some sort will be warranted. I hope the message that is delivered here today is to take into heart by the committee. I know it is a tight budget year and there will be many competing requests, but I think the testimony that has been and will be given here today demonstrates that this is something that the community desires and will benefit greatly from. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Commissioner Durkett. Yes, that's okay, go right here. Thank you so much, Chairman White, and thank you for having me here today. My name is Casey Durkett, and I am the Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner for Single Member District 6B05. That's the area located between Eastern Market and Lincoln Park in Capitol Hill. With homes just three blocks away from the Southeast Library, 6B05 represents an area that will be directly impacted when this 100-year-old library, the second oldest in the district, closes for two years this summer to undergo renovations. During the two-year closure, the DC Public Library has stated that it will not offer interim services at or near the site of the Southeast Library. Critical Basic services like access to computers, free internet to find a job or connect with family online, book pickup and drop off, printing for a school project or story time for kids struggling to connect in a post-COVID world, all gone from this location. 
This quickly approaching reality has brought me here today to testify in support of interim library services during this closure. As you've heard from my fellow commissioners, we don't come to you without solutions to this problem. Solutions at nearby DC facilities that council member Charles Allen supported when we met with him just two weeks ago. But I wanna use my time to express how this affects the community in their words. Before the hearing, I reached out to nearly 400 neighbors to ask why the Southeast Library is important to them, what services they rely on, how they'd be affected without interim services, and whether they could use the Northeast branch as the next closest location. I was overwhelmed with responses, receiving 20 within the first 30 minutes, and their responses reflect not just the need and desire for interim services, but also why the current solution to use the Northeast branch is just not enough. For example, I talked to David L., who said that he's a senior citizen close to 80 years old that loves the Southeast Library but cannot walk all the way to the Northeast Branch or otherwise get there because the Northeast Library has no direct public transport. And David's right. We've been told that when the Northeast Library closed, the Southeast Library served as its interim services location. But these two libraries are not equivalents, and I stress this. Unlike the Northeast Library, you can reach the Southeast Library on three different metro lines and on multiple bus routes, like the 32 or 36. For people like Marcus, who lives in 6B07, that difference cannot be understated, with an address that is a nearly 40-minute walk away to the Northeast Library branch. I also heard from Ursula, a retired senior that loves to come each month to the book sale at the library, and Betsy and David, 40-year Capitol Hill residents that use the library about once per week to pick up books, but quote, admit that they are older and often find walking to the Northeast Library to be a struggle that would essentially be shutting them out from the library access for the next two years. In addition to the impact that this closure has on our aging, our infirm, or our differently abled populations, Alyssa spoke to the impact on our kids. Her two 11-year-old twins make frequent use of the Southeast Library and like to explore the shelves and check out books independently. And Michael reminded me of the impact of ending story time for kids. In his words, two years is a long time in a child's life critical years that may mean the difference between a child becoming a lifelong reader and patron of public spaces, or one for whom reading and libraries are a thing people only talk about on TV. Finally, two nights ago at our ANC 6B commission meeting, we heard from Ishan Haru, the chief impact officer at Community Connections just down the street from the Southeast Library. Mr. Haru works with veterans, young adults, and neighbors experiencing homelessness. And during the meeting, he offered his support for interim services on behalf of Community Connections. All of these examples highlight how dearly the constituents of this area value interim services. And we know that you value them too at nearly $23 million for the renovation. So we're asking you to not let that value slide to $0 for two years. We're asking you to value them as much as you did when you provided interim services during the shutdowns of the Southwest and Foggy Bottom branch libraries. We're asking for basic services like computer, internet, book pickup and drop off, printing and story time at a nearby location to maintain continuity and level of service. Ensuring that when the library reopens in two years, there's a community that is willing to come back to this historic location. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, next we have Vince Moreno, 6D07. Thank you. So counselors, my name is Vince Moreno. I am the elected ANC representative for 6B07. I represent Hill East from 12th to 15th streets between South Carolina and Pennsylvania avenues. Uh, in between the time when I first submitted the draft testimony and now our ANC voted to authorize me to officially speak on behalf of all 6B along with all my other three colleagues. And because I'm the closer, I might be diverging a little bit from my draft testimony to make sure we're covering the most important points. 6B07 is in Hill East. Our tiny but dense neighborhood proudly includes several apartment buildings and publicly supported housing developments with low car ownership. People in this neighborhood don't drive to the library, they walk. 
For my house, for example, Google Maps listed as a 12 minute walk to Southeast and a 21 minute walk to Northeast. That is accurate if you're a middle-aged man like me walking alone. It's not at all accurate when I'm walking with my daughter or when my neighbors on either side of my house walk to the library with their toddlers or when my elderly neighbors who are four homes down in Kentucky courts walk to the library. I found then it's more like a 16 minute walk to Southeast and a 30 minute walk to Northeast. The bus from Lincoln Park to Northeast Library only runs every half hour. The bus from Southeast Library to Northeast Library only runs every 24 minutes. And thanks to the mayor's budget cuts, those buses aren't free. I can afford the bus, but the huge number of indigent citizens who use the clinic at 7th and Penn or the community services at 8th and Penn can't always afford it. I applaud the efforts of the council, the mayor, and the DC Public Library System to renovate our library buildings. While the quality of the library buildings is improving, however, the quantity remains too low for a city of 700,000. And now, for about two years, that quantity will drop by one as the DC Public Library System proposes to shut down the Southeast Library without maintaining a temporary facility. As it happens, both my wife and I come from library families. Uh, my mom was a library assistant, uh, my wife's mom, full librarian, both of us and our siblings served as temporary clerks in our younger days, and we all have lived through library renovations. As it happens, this is the first one any of us can recall living through or an entire neighborhood just lost its library for the interim. We know that the Southeast Library won't be selling its books when its doors closed, nor will it be laying off its staff. The city will continue to bear those storage and labor costs throughout the renovation. So why not put them to use at a temporary facility in our neighborhood? We are supposed to assume that a temporary facility would be too costly, but as anyone who has been following this project knows, the lion's share of the costs come from the DC, DC public library systems profligate extravagant expending on underground construction in the name of historic preservation. Now, if there are any library patrons out there who frequent the Southeast library right now, but would not frequent it, in the future, if it expanded upward instead of downward, please raise your hands now and I will personally apologize to each and every one of you. But preserving the look of a library while failing for two years to provide actual library service is an obscene dereliction of duty. Another enormous chunk of the budget that the DC public library system does not like to admit to is the inflation borne during the interminable planning process, which is now in its fifth year of public meetings without a single shovel in the ground. If the city can afford to pay the design build team of Whiting Turner Construction, Quinn Evans Architects to attend meetings for five years, it can surely pay librarians already on the payroll to stay in the same neighborhood where they already work. DC needs more libraries, not fewer, especially in the growing Eastern side of the city. Even after the new Congress Heights Library is finished, there will only be three in Ward 8 and two in Ward 5. We've already heard from library staff that when Northeast closed, Southeast was the backup location, and so we should put up with the same. Well, that was mistreatment of the people who live near Northeast. That same logic of we've mistreated you before could easily be used to deny wards five and eight the libraries that they obviously need. But at the minimum, I think we can agree on one thing today. Shutting down a popular location for two years with no backup is a step in the wrong direction. There are numerous unused and underused buildings in Capitol Hill, Hill East, Navy Yard, the Armory, or Barney Circle that would be cheap or even free from a budgeting perspective. I endorse no particular location as my favorite, although I will note that the landlord for the former COVID service center in Eastern Market recently confirmed that he's quite willing to rent out to DC again on basically the same terms that he rented to DC before. Renting to that space again, in other words, wouldn't require a budget increase, just moving the allocated rent money from the health department to the library system. In sum, though, all I ask is that the DC public library officials admit that they can and should provide interim services to the residents of Southeast while their Southeast library is being renovated, and that they should be doing the same for anyone in any DC neighborhood when their library is renovated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, 
Joanne Hoyt, Commissioner of 4802. Okay, I don't think Commissioner Hoyt is here. If you are, raise your, oh, I see you, there you go. If you can join us, cut the screen on, cut your mic on. We're waiting for you, Commissioner. Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair White. Thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to testify about something that is dear to my heart, my community library. I am the commissioner for the Shepherd Park neighborhood in single member district 4802. Um, and since I became commissioner, I've learned that the DC Public Library has slated our library, the Juanita E. Thornton Shepherd Park Library for quote unquote replacement. Um, in the mayor's FY 2024 proposed budget, she allocates $25 million to replace our library with a full service library at a location south of the existing library. Although the word replace appears both in the 2021 Next Libris Master Plan and in the mayor's um, budget proposal for next year, its meaning is opaque. By all indications, it must mean that our library is going to go to Walter Reed, the new development in our neighborhood. And I gathered that, that much from a meeting with the Walter Reed developer managing partner, Ms. Vicki Davis, on February the 24th of this year, when she invited me to that campus and gave me a tour and indicated to me where the library was going to go. And then I also had a meeting with Execu Executive Director of DC Public Library, Mr. Richard Reyes Gavlin, on, um, sorry, on Mar April the 3rd. And in that meeting, he informed me that he had done an earlier tour of the Walter Reed campus and that he was opposed to um, the, there are two historical smokestacks on that property. And he said he was opposed to the library going there. So the indications are, although the mayor's budget and next Libris doesn't say where the library is going to be replaced or the indication is that it's going to Walter Reed. Now, I am opposing that on behalf of my constituents for various reasons. I think that it would deprive our community of accessibility to a necessary resource that has been central to my community since 1990. And that by re relocating it to Walter Reed, it would only help to enrich the Walter Reed developer. Now, here are my reasons. Our library is located at, sorry, at 7420 Georgia Avenue. It took dedicated neighbors led by Miss Juanita E. Thornton. Her campaign was books over burgers or books, not burgers. And the city built the library where it is. It opened in 1990 and the services has been immeasurable to me and my children and everyone who has lived in this community, but particularly to the affordable housing low income kids who live on either side of Georgia Avenue where the library is located. Their parents has, have informed me that that library is so important to many of them who do not have computer services and go there to do their homework and to use com the computer after school and on weekends. 
many of the residents in my community also have indicated to me that they, it is within walking distance and they and their children habitually go there, whether it is for um, toddler reading hours or the all the other services and programs that are available. The seniors in my community have informed me that they go there for yoga class, art class. Last night we were there and the Folgered Shakespeare Theatre Company was conducting a play there. So our library is so important and I don't understand and the DC Public Library nor the mayor have not explained to us why they are slating it to be moved. Um, the library also supports the vitality of the Upper Georgia Avenue Commercial Corridor. It creates a daytime walk in traffic that supports small businesses. Relocating it to Walter Reed will, will dis stabilize our neighborhood and make Walter Reed the center of our community, which it has never been. Keeping our library in the current location will encourage the high-end residents who are coming to Walter Reed. Many of them have to earn perhaps more than $300,000 to live in one of those condos that start at over $700,000 to, to, to buy. Um, and I think it's fiscally irresponsible. Thank you, If you can, um, and with your closing remarks, it'd be helpful. You're like a minute over your time. We want to be respectful of everyone's time. I, I am sorry. So it's fiscally ir irresponsible to spend about $25 million of taxpayers' dollar for the Walter Reed um, project. And I am going, and the last thing I have to say, please bear with me. Um, the DC Public Library has never engaged us, has never ever asked us in a meaningful way what should become of our library. I rest at this point and we'll Thank take you. questions. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I'm hearing that sentiment from your commission and several other commissions. And we've even heard this during the a performance oversight hearing and we talked to the director about that. So we are going to stop there um, and jump back to Commissioner Wilson. Uh, is he still here? I don't see Commissioner Wilson here. Um, uh, while we're looking, we're searching for him. Um, I want to ask uh, in, any, I guess it's, it's for any uh, commissioners um, in 6B, because I'm gathering, trying to get some understanding and moving forward. Um, for this library that's in Hill East, uh, Southeast Library, how many meetings, if any, were held to address uh, the issue of libraries in Hill East? I heard six, then I heard five. Just trying to get some clarity on what was the discussion if, in those meetings with DC Public Library. Then I heard it wasn't no outreach. So I'm trying to get some clarity on that. Anyone can I chime can, in from the commission. I can speak to that if if I'm uh, uh, able to. Am I? Um, uh, are you hearing me? Yep, I can hear you perfectly. Great, thank you. Uh, there were uh, at least six or seven community meetings, but during those community meetings, the issue of interim facilities rarely was broached by the library representatives. What happened was we had community representatives who mentioned the possibility that we would have no interim services. And the library response was always, oh, don't worry, we'll give you interim services. I quoted from the library's own records of those meetings. Um, I do not think there was any outreach towards seven or eight about the library. Um, and so uh, it was really only people in 6B who even knew of these community meetings, most of which took place at the library. Um, and as I say, when the issue of interim facilities came up at all, the library said, oh, don't worry, we'll give you interim facilities. And they are going back on their word and they're violating their own guidelines. Got it. 
um, there, there was also some conversation about travel distance. Um, in those conversations, were they uh, suggesting that you all go to, uh, I guess you labeled it in the Northeast Library as, as an alternative space? What was that conversation? Uh, that's what they're telling us now. They told us during the community meetings that we would have interim services within the immediate vicinity of the Southeast branch. Now what they're saying, aside from a kid's story time, which we found ourselves, thanks to Brian Reddy, who's the executive director of Barracks Row Main Street, uh, aside from the kid's story time, uh, one hour a week, uh, they are saying now, oh, we really didn't mean it about interim facility or interim services. You better just walk up to the Northeast branch which as I said is 0.9, according to Google directions, 0.9 miles, almost one full mile from the Southeast branch and a lot longer for the people in our ANC who live in public housing, a lot longer for the people in our ANC who live uh, in the Eastern part of the ANC and a lot, lot longer for people who live in Ward 8 in your ward in Navy Yard or people who live in Ward 7 um, yeah. in the Hill East area. So I also heard you talk about the uh, Southeast Library Task Force. Um, who is that comprised of? And uh, have you had any official meetings with the director with the with this uh, task force? That's a wonderful question, uh, council member. Uh, we have had uh, seven of our nine ANC commissioners involved in the task force. We founded the, we formed the task force in January at our first meeting of this year's ANC. Uh, we've now had uh, six meetings of the task force. We've met every two weeks since the uh, first meeting that we had. Um, and we've had, as I say, seven of the nine ANC commissioners have attended and 30 residents of the ANC have attended our meetings. We have what reached is, out- what is, the, what, is the, what is the goal of the task force? Oh, we have three missions for the task force. The first okay. mission is to secure an interim facility during the time our library will be closed. Okay. Uh, we, we, we really need a place to pick up and drop off books. We need free access to the internet. We need a copier and a scanner and uh, a uh, printer. Uh, the basic services that libraries perform. We also are working to connect the library with the residents who live near the library, whose uh, lives will be very much disrupted by the construction. Uh, we had a uh, construction meeting just two nights ago on uh, the 11th, um, during which some of the residents living near the library were surprised at some of the things the library representatives were telling them. Um, and the third thing we would like to have is some input. It's a late uh, it's late to do this, but we think that we might still be able to have some input into the design of the library. And to answer your earlier question, we have reached out to Richard Ray's Gavilon repeatedly, and he has refused to meet with the task force. And so we ask you to, to use whatever influence you have to convince Richard Ray's Gavilon to actually meet with us and explain to us what the library so far has refused to tell us, which is what, if anything, aside from the kids' story time, which we actually got ourselves. Um, explain to us what they have done, if anything, to secure interim library services. I got that. I got a few more questions um, for Commissioner Shapitl. Correct me, which is that? Uh, she, she had a work meeting at uh, uh, 1230, so she may not be on anymore. Okay, I guess I will ask the other commissioners. Yeah, I see Commissioner Durkett is still here. Um, and also Moreno. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, what is, uh, what, have you all discussed a temporary space? I heard you talk about kind of this mobile thing, but I wanted to know, have you all discussed a temporary space as ideal for the community? I think that there have been multiple spaces identified by the task force, and this is part of our discussion that we had with Council Member Charles Allen recently, which was 
what if the lowest impact is that we use existing DC facilities? What if we use the recreation centers that are nearby? What if we use any, any currently rented DC government facility to set up a place where there might be a table for a printer, maybe a quiet place to come pick up or drop off your books? We're talking about maybe just a corner of that recreation facility, and we're hoping it's as close to the center of uh, that area, the Southeast Library area that we can get. But there's also been discussions as Commissioner Sobelson mentioned, of other uh, privately owned spaces, spaces that are in that area. If you recall on 8th Street in the Barracks Row area, there was a DC uh, COVID health center. Of course, those shut down for the last time on March 31st, and now it's vacant. That space is just one block from the Southeast Library and is right next to the Eastern Market Metro stop and bus stops that we've been talking about. So that's a great option as well. That seems like it would be a good comparator to when the Foggy Bottom branch shut down and they use the Watergate Hotel and a suite in the Watergate Hotel to provide those interim services. So that could be an equivalent also. Give me what you just said about the Watergate Hotel space. Yes, and I believe uh, Commissioner Solison can speak to this as well, but when the Foggy Bottom branch shut down and in that West End area, they actually use the Watergate as its interim services location. And as Commissioner Solison can and speak to, they actually used a suite within the Watergate to provide those interim services. Okay. And what are your guys' thought on, thoughts on this mobile library? I mean, because that is contingent upon availability, weather, um, types of books. I just want to get some more details on that because I heard you say Councilman Bond suggested that. And has the library director or staff um, found some concessions for that at all yet? If I may uh, quickly on this point, as has already been raised, a, uh, a trailer and actually a shipping container was used when the Southwest Library shut down. And that container was just a small space that you could come into to do most of these small services that we're talking about. Part of the work of the task force has been tracking down that trailer. Is it still available? Can we still use it? And then where would we put it? That is a good question that we're also trying to work through. Is it in a nearby parking lot? Is it uh, near the construction site? So that would be also ideal deal if we could get a space like that if we could repurpose the uh, container that was used for the southwest library if we could get something mobile if a facility is out of the question uh, and we could probably if i can add one more thing we could probably buy or rent something like that even if there's not one currently available uh and not have to spend an enormous amount of money we don't need something brand new we don't need something really uh polished we just need a space. Got it. All right. Thank you. Uh, we will we'll be asking some of these questions um, to the government uh, st uh, staff and, and also director. Um, and it, we ask you, Ms. Commissioner Ashley, if you can submit those recommendations to the committee, because um, I, I do know um, that Councilmember Allen is concerned about this as well. Um, that can be helpful for us as well if we have those solution based uh, conversations with DC Public Libraries. Absolutely. Thank uh, you. It's, it's RYA. Um, you signed up RYA at DC Council.gov. Um, that's the email. R is in Recreation um, Youth Affairs, RYA. Okay. All right, um, I want to jump to uh, uh, Commissioner Hoyt. Um, how specifically were your community being denied to library at Walter Reed? We've, I talked to Council Member Janice Lewis George, and she is upset about this uh, steaming hot. Um, and in the in the hearing. I believe the director said they are still considering those requests from the community because we heard it from the from the agency commissioners, from some of the residents. We've also heard it from the uh, council member that represents that ward um, about you know where to put the library and what to do. We heard nothing from I guess the potential Walter Reed residents or those close in proximity. Um, 
but I did want to know, um, uh, uh, did you all draft your commissioner draft a letter or anything to the library uh, director? And it has you have you gotten an official response yet? In, in on the 26th of February, we sent a ANC4 sent a resolution to the council, the mayor, and the um, library asking for an impact study to be done um, before any decision is made to move our library. And we got a response from the director, the executive director of public libraries, the yeah. following the following day saying that he would get back in touch with us he has never gotten back in touch with us we don't know what happened to that resolution so i know that the that dc public libraries did a survey and i remember reading through the survey and i want to say it was less than 200 people in the survey um and so i did read through that and i i, I can imagine uh if it's uh 12,000 people living close by that 200 is a small fraction. And just, I was just trying to get some understanding of what the sample size was and how did they determine where they get these, uh, this, this feedback from, because it was kind of lenient towards one side. Yeah. It wasn't, yeah. So. So, so Chair White, I'm glad you raised that question. So it's one of the most important questions, um, uh, this survey. It was done because the community was saying, we never got involved. How was this decision made? And the survey is a survey monkey survey. And last night we had uh, the Friends of the Li Shepherd Park Library had a community meeting at which we invited um, a retired professor whose name is Dr. Ernestine Hargrove to explain to us this survey. And I can submit to you her report because she has forwarded it to me and it's basically too long for me to go into right now. But what she's saying, the outcome of the survey is not reliable or verifiable. And she added quite a few factors that make this survey not worth the paper that it's written on. Can you on. give us an example of why it's not reliable or verifiable? Yes. Um, like 70, it, there was, uh, I, I think you said 200 people, but actually the survey, the number of people who participated in the survey was a little over 1,100. And I've never seen more than eleven hundred. That must be new to me. Well, <laughs> yeah. Seen, well, like, well, yes. But but a, a large majority of them did not do not live in this community. Okay. The survey was available online, and people could just pull it up and and do it. But also, the the DC Public Library printed copies of the survey and left it at the library. And I went to the library because some of my constituents could not get there uh, because they're elderly. And I picked up surveys and had them distribute. But I could go in there and walk out with 50 paper copy surveys. And no one knew if I was going to go home. They didn't ask and fill them out myself and return them. That amount of lack of scrutiny is one factor that um, Dr. Hargrove point to why this survey is not reliable. She doesn't understand, it mentions focus groups without saying who they were, who were the moderators of the focus groups. It mentions, um, she, she thinks that there was a bit of unethical conversation in the research. Um, she spoke about the survey monkey is not an analytical tool. It's just an Excel spreadsheet and it's a data dump essentially. Um, she wants to know where is the analysis and how is it that DC Public Library can rely on this to make the kind of decision that is going to impact our community this way. I, I can send as an attachment to my written testimony, so, sorry, to my oral testimony, her report, unless there's something else you would like to know about. Um, let me try to work through that. 
you can send it if you can email that to me or send it to me i request it from them as well but i want to see her analysis of what she said yes um, that would be helpful to me um okay. five minutes over my time for this hearing and i know we promised office of cable television we'll try to head to the schedule so i want to thank you guys for uh speaking up for residents who uh may not even know this hearing is going on and being a true voice and advocacy for what you all need in the community because reality is that we work for you guys and the moment we forget that then we need to be gone out of here um so thank you for that i look forward to following up um, my email is twhite at dccouncil.gov feel free to reach out to me or my staff um uh, dr hoskins or uh or cal uh, who is on here now um cal yell dale uh, KL Dale, you, you'll see it. Um, they'll leave the information in the chat as well so we can follow up. Um, thank you. And let me see, I see the question from Ms. Paula Edwards. Yes, Ms. Paula Edwards, you are up next. Um, so let me go to the next list. Paula Edwards, Kate Judson, Commissioner, I'm sorry, Commissioner Hudson, Commissioner Edwards, Commissioner Cornotes, Commissioner Elisa Brooks. Robert Oliver, President, Federation of Friends, DC Public Libraries. Um, Lewis Turner, Friends of Emory, uh, in that order. Uh, Ms. Edwards, you can go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair White and council members for giving me this opportunity to testify today. I'm Paula Edwards, DC native, Ward 4 resident, current ANC commissioner for Ward 4 A01, but these remarks are my own. I'm a lifelong patron of DC public libraries, as well as the largest public library in the world, the Library of Congress that is housed in the city. I've been through the construction and reconstruction of MLK Library, Books Not Burgers, and the construction of the Juanita Thornton Library. I will submit my revised remarks in writing before the close of the record. I would like to commend DCPL and this committee for the beautiful Lillian J. Huff Lamond Riggs Library. Mrs. Huff would be and her family is justifiably proud of this valuable community resource in the neighborhood for which she advocated. Finally, I would like to address the discussions regarding Ex Libris, the Juanita, the Juanita J. Thornton Shepherd Park Library, and a new library for which $25 million has been budgeted. We are in the middle of discussing the various possibilities for this investment. I've discarded my prepared remarks after attending a meeting on the subject at the library Wednesday evening, and would like to speak to the process rather than advocate for a specific outcome. Contrary to framing by some, this is not a Marvel superhero movie. There are no good guys and bad guys in this discussion. There are only people advocating for their communities and the city in the face of budget realities and the goal of equitably sharing public resources among as many residents as possible. To the degree that we can openly share information, respect each other's viewpoints, even when they differ from our own, and respect each other, I believe that we will achieve optimum outcomes. To the degree that we rely on gossip, assumptions, supposition, misinformation, innuendo, and do not engage with each other respectfully, we will merely reinforce the noise bouncing off the walls of our respective echo chambers. Libraries are not proxies for ex economic investment, community engagement, or other concerns. They are repositories for information and learning. They produce ancillary effects, but we cannot lose focus on their primary purpose. We have to rely on and trust accurate, timely information from our experts on library administration and science and not substitute our judgment for theirs, especially as this field has changed as dramatically as this one with technological advances. They are experts in 21st century libraries, and we are experts in our communities. We must work together and listen to each other whether or not we like what we hear. If organizations tasked with administering access to information are not forthcoming and transparently sharing information, then the process is damaged from the start. Finally, I have an outcome that I prefer, but I am more invested in the best outcome for the community and the city. I know that the optimum outcome will be gained through cooperation, respect, and the transparent sharing of good data. We look to the leadership of the council, the mayor's office, and DCPL in achieving this goal. Thank you. 
Thank you. Commissioner Jetson. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman White. My name is Commissioner Kate Judson, and I'm the ANC Commissioner for Single Member District 4D02. SMD 4D02 covers the Brightwood Park, Petworth neighborhoods, including four blocks of Kennedy Street Northwest from 3rd to 7th Streets Northwest. I'm here today to testify to ask for your support to construct a new Ward 4 public library at 5th and Kennedy Streets Northwest within my SMD to fill the service gap in Brightwood Park. My fellow ANC 4D commissioners and I have also submitted an ANC 4D resolution in March 2023, encouraging DC public libraries to build a new Ward 4 library here at 5th and Kennedy Streets Northwest. So why 5th and Kennedy? The corner of 5th and Kennedy Streets Northwest has struggled for decades with gun violence and criminal activity. Having lived a block from this intersection for over 10 years, I have lost track of the number of shootouts and other violent activity that has occurred at this intersection. The southeast corner of 5th and Kennedy is currently home to a rundown strip mall with a vacant check cash store and a bus stop covered in graffiti. The addition of a library at this intersection would be a true asset to the neighborhood and a way to transform this troubled corner. A library at 5th and Kennedy would provide a safe space for teens to receive supportive and positive opportunities, including youth programming and enrichment classes after school. In addition, access to the internet and computers, a place to job search and study would be a really positive addition to this neighborhood and fill a critical gap that many of our neighbors face, including youth, seniors, and multilingual residents. Currently, the closest libraries are over one mile from this intersection, so not at all walkable for residents. Finally, there is a short-term family housing residence, the Kennedy, within 500 feet of this intersection. This housing has a large population of unhoused families, a lot of children, who would benefit from access to a public library, and it would literally be across the street. In addition, there are five daycares within two blocks of this intersection, and having a library for these caregivers and children would be a huge benefit as well. Now, I understand and recognize that acquiring a property by eminent domain is not an easy feat. However, I implore the district government to make the commitment and investment in this process to transform this blighted intersection into a space for a library. ANC 4D is here to support in any way that we can, and we will be submitting a comprehensive package of testimony as a commission. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Kunitzes. Good afternoon, uh, Council Member White. My name is Chrysanthi Corniotis. Uh, most people call me Cece. I am just uh, here. I represent single member district 4D04, which um, <clears throat> encompasses from Hamilton Street Northwest up until Decatur and the area of Georgia Avenue that is um, that comes within those two uh, cross streets. I uh, come here today to, in support of my fellow commissioner, Commissioner Judson, as well as to speak specifically on the need for um, a library at Fifth and Kennedy given the fact that in our 4D community, as Commissioner Judson mentioned, there are several um, daycares, but this uh, single member district is also growing leaps and bounds when it comes to young families moving into the area. But at the same time, our, our member district is also uh, heavily populated with elderly seniors who rely on a safe space to you know, go to more consistently. And as Commissioner Judson stated, the closest library is over a mile away. Um, and for a ward, you know, ward four being um, one of the largest, if not the largest populated wards in the city, um, there aren't 
enough libraries for the number of residents um, in our in our ward. And this specific um, construction would enable um, our commission on a whole as well to hold uh, more public meetings. Uh, there are limited um, choices that we have currently uh, in that regard as well. Um, and I think that it would just serve to really increase the, or improve, I guess, the perception of Kennedy Street on the whole currently, because, you know, most of the news stories that come out of Kennedy is, you know, crime related. And, you know, Kennedy is so much more than that. And I think that we deserve, as a community, a safe space that in includes uh, availability for residents to have free Wi-Fi access, to apply to jobs for our children, to go after school, um, and so on and so forth. So I come today uh, in support of not only my uh, commissioner Judson, but also the other commissioners that testified um, earlier. And I welcome any questions. Great, thank you. Um, commissioner Brooks, full B08. Don't see Miss Brooks. If you are in the in the waiting room, you raise your hand. We can bring you into uh, make you live and activate you. Sometimes when commissioners put their title for commissioner in the front, it's hard to find commissioners. Um, so we want to make sure you're there. All right, so we're going to go right along. Commissioner Robert Oliver, President of Federation of Friends of D.C. Okay, I'm trying to get in. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. But we can't see you, but we can hear you. Yep. Okay, let me... Uh, if you can see... You're going in and out. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to say, uh, I've heard a lot of great testimony being given and I look forward to hearing more during this day. I think that uh, these uh, budget hearing meetings and uh, hearings in general are a great civic lesson for all those within uh, the city. Uh, I'd also like to say that thank you, uh, Council Member Treyon White Senior, the committee staff and fellow guests. It is a pleasure to give testimony at today's DCPL budget hearing. The District of Columbia Public Library is the most appreciated of DC agencies. In 2022, it was recognized as being undeniably the best city agency. The MLK rooftop was also recognized as the best place to work remotely. In addition, DCPL was awarded the Downtown Program or Partnership of the Year Award for its vision and direction on public programming at the historic Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. This award was presented by the Downtown DC Public, public um, I'll say Business Improvement District in March, 2023. However, all of this could be lost. The mayor has proposed a 2.3% decrease in her proposed fiscal year 24 budget. The decrease impacts on the operating budget with a 15% reduction in non-personnel services and the elimination of 18.5 vacant positions. The public safety positions were spared from this cut. However, this reduction means more work for the remaining staff. The story is different in the capital budget, however. Southeast will receive 10 million for its construction costs while library infrastructure, technology, and fleet vehicles will receive over 7 million in funding between fiscal years 2024 through 2029. The Federation of Library Friends asked that 
the DCPL fiscal year 24 budget be protected from further cuts. We realize that the pandemic has impacted city revenues now and possibly in the future. However, should DC experience recovery, we recommend funding of more staff. The DC branches have taken on several duties over the years. The branches serve as cooling centers, hypothermia centers, a place for families to communicate via computer with incarcerated loved ones, polling sites, and other services. Lastly, DCPL was integral in the plan by Dr. Laquandra S. Nesbitt, MD, DC Health Director, in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. I ask that the DC Department of Behavioral Health partner with DCPL to provide mental health professionals in our branches. These professionals will be available to address the needs of patrons and staff as needed. This partnership allows the Department of Behavioral Health to gauge the level of need within the community and to work remotely at a branch. This is a no cost or low cost objective that should be considered. Now that the COVID-19 pandemic is ebbing, it is now the time to address the potential looming mental health crisis. Also, we hope to see a new security director hired soon to ensure our facilities remain a safe, friendly family environment. In conclusion, please protect DCPL from further budget cuts during council deliberations. Consider a partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health to provide mental health counseling in the branches and ensure that security remains a top priority. Thank you very much. I'm available to take any questions. Thank you. Brother Lou Turner, friends of Emory. Good evening, Councilman White. Good. You hear me? Yep. Um, it's Emory Heights. It's not Emory. Um, we got the name changed. We came down to the um, um, down to the um, Wilson building. It's, em it's Emory Heights Community Center. Well, when you submit it, because I remember this is the second time you say that. So when you submit your request to speak, I put, I put Emory. I put the friends of Emory Heights. It has Emory Heights on there. That's how I did that, sir. Yes. Okay. But I'm, I'm gonna keep it short right here. I'm gonna piggyback off um the lady about um the library on Fifth and Kennedy. That's a good spot. But the the problem that we have in the community is divided, and divided is we the, um the, together we stand, divided we fall. If all of us come together as to one. And, and we all sit together as and, and uh, fight for that library on Fifth and Kennedy. That will be a really good spot because if you do your homework, we have three high schools, and we have three three um, middle schools and elementary schools, and we have some charter schools around. That's five um, three to five minutes from Fifth and Kennedy where those kids could come. For instance, like Paul, Capital City, Truesdale, Latin, Brightwood, all that is close. Okay, some of the kids can't go to um to Shepherd Park or can go down to um, Petworth Library due to the conflicts of the community. And what I'm saying that this is, um, they don't need no uh, um, library in Walter Reed. Cause Walter Reed, would you, um, if it ain't broke up Shepherd Park, what's the use of um, fixing it for? You know, that's all they doing is jump on up Walter Reed, like they say, with all with that, with the has, you got the has and the has nots. You know, a lot of people, a lot of kids, youth and seniors ain't gonna be good, can't afford to go to the has. But if you do a reality and you look and you put it on Fifth and Kennedy and you do the dynamic and you see the schools, the youth, the um, the um, the daycares and everything, Fifth and Kennedy is a perfect spot. And I want to, I want to tell the people that's in the, um in the four B community. We don't know. We don't know y'all. Um, y'all ANCs. Y'all don't come up to the Emory Heights Community Center where that you can reach out and get to um, know other people. Is it's like y'all having sidebar, um, sidebar um, uh, meetings like in a basement or somewhere where we gotta find y'all. Come out and put this stuff out into the public. Emory is the Emory is the um the mecca of Kennedy Street. So if you put everything up there, we had the seniors come there doing their taxes. Everything that they doing in the library, they doing it at the center. But we do need a library for all from the youth all the way to the seniors. But you know, I could talk, I'm gonna keep it, I'm gonna keep it short. But but uh, the, the ladies that was talking is around the Kennedy Street area. My name is uh, I'm Lou Turner now, but come meet Coach Lou. Coach Lou Turner 
it um is a community activist that's I've been born I've been um born and raised uptown around Kennedy Street for over 50 years. Y'all just moving in. I could tell you more about my community than y'all could tell. I know my community. So what I'm asking is, while y'all listening, please come up and have a meeting with me. And we can sit down and we can make it better. And we might, then we can get that library. Cause I have, I have 12 um, um, young adults here cause they don't know about these meetings and stuff like this here. So they are watching to see how I um, productive and, and um, sit here and talk. Cause a lot of kids, they want to talk but they're afraid, but I'm telling them to open up now. So you're gonna start seeing a lot of um, uh, youth to come up, I'm saying youth is from 18 from 18 to 24, they're gonna start speaking. Cause as I go to these hearings, I don't see no youth from 18 to 24 speak. And they, they got a voice. Those same ones that you think they shooting on Kennedy Street, they trying to get saved. They want to get saved for real. So don't be afraid of them. Just go out there and help them and talk to them. But um, thank you, Councilman White, I appreciate it. And I'll talk to you later. Have a blessed day. Thank you so much. Um, before you go, Coach Lou, uh, did you say that uh, the Fifth and Kennedy location was a good spot or not a good spot? That's a great spot. You know, I'm, not, I'm uptown. That's a great spot to have right there for there. Because guess what? You can't. The kids can't go up to Shepherd Park or they can't go down to Pet, um, Petworth Library. It's conflicts. But if there's no conflicts, is it's easy access to everyone in that community. Everyone. So what is your suggestion for the youth that live close to Shepherd Park? They, they need to go to Shepherd Park um, right there on um, that same library they're going because I go there, I, I go up to the Shepherd Park Library. That's a great library up there. It don't need to be in no Walter Reed. They just trying to jumble. Walter Reed is going to be a, 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 a spot where everything is just jumbled in. I'm looking at it now as they fix it. It don't look like, but it's like a big mess. It's like a big, everybody think it look good. It's a big mess. Gotcha. Thank you. I want to jump to. You're welcome. Uh, May I ask before Coach Lou uh, signs off, can you provide oh, us? Point of, um, point, of, point of order, point of order. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I yeah, apologize. You, if you got a question, you put in the chat because I have to check okay. it. Karen, you can't ask a question through me to another person. If you put in the chat, that'd be helpful for me. Um. I want to go to Commissioner Edwards. Uh, you referenced having been through several library renovations over the years. Um, how is this particular set of renovations handled differently? That's so, the problem. It's not. <laughs> the Books Not Burgers was, I mean, it was the outcome I thought was the best outcome for the site. But there was conflict. There was misinformation. There wasn't clear communication from the government. That was 40 years ago. and. I would think that now the process might be better that everybody could sit down, the people who wanted it Fifth and Kennedy, the people who wanted it Walter Reed, the people who wanted it Shepherd Park, and we could discuss what the different options are. But it, it's kind of like um, Coach Lou said, people don't want to cross territories, they're conflicts. So we're not sitting down, we're not getting all the facts apparently from DCPL. We're not talking to each other, we're staying in our own little echo chambers. And I don't think we're going to get the best outcome or the best expenditure of public funds. Thank you. Thank you. And have you been at any of these commissioner meetings where the library did a presentation? And if so, what was the consensus about, uh, I guess, Walter Reed, not Walter Reed, and was the new location of Fifth and Kennedy proposed? Uh, there's been no consensus really. I think things have been so nebulous and that's what's led to the confusion. Nobody said, this is what we would propose at Walter Reed. This is what we would propose at Fifth and Kennedy. This is what we would propose in keeping the Juanita Thornton Library open because we have kind of a make everybody happy proposal, which would be to put um, a library at either Fifth and Kennedy or in Brightwood Park or Manor Park and also keep the Juanita Thornton Library. So that's the make everybody happy proposal, which may not make everybody happy depending on what it costs. So, you know, it, it's been so nebulous that we haven't really had a chance to develop anything. The survey that was developed was not a scientific survey as Commissioner Hoyt pointed out, but I don't know if it was meant to be that. So the, the process has just been really muddy. 
Thank you. Um, Commissioner Court Quinity, um, would you have an opinion about that? She's still here. I don't hear her. I see her, but I don't hear her um, there. Okay. Let me jump to um, Commissioner Judson. Hi, yes, I'm here. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Yeah, yeah. So I heard you talk about the property um, that you guys are proposing. Um, and you said it's a strip mall. And do you know the owner of strip mall? And I heard you mention eminent domain, which that has to come from the mayor. Dimpe and also the city administrator. Yes, yes, there is an owner, Mr. Kim, I believe. Uptown Main Street uh, has a, a fairly good connection with this individual uh, who owns the property. So uh, uh, is this property owner in favor of this? Have you had conversations about him about this or with the owner? I have not. I know. Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. And you, said, uh, you also noted that there was a violence there and you said this would be a safe space for a library. How do you all say this? How can you come to this conclusion if there's violence there to be safe space for a library? Great question. So first, um, no, I have not had contact with the owner personally. I know Councilwoman Lewis George, um, who is advocating for this location as well. Um, she may have, I can't speak for her, but um, she is someone who is very supportive of this. Um, so maybe further along in her conversations. Um, in terms of the safety, I think having, I think one of the challenges that I've observed over the last 10 years of living um, just off of Kennedy is that there aren't a lot of, there are not places to congregate that are safe um, along the corridor unless you're going to purchase something in a store. There's a lot of carryouts, there's daycares, but having a third space, a space where folks can go um, access computers, access programmings, uh, I think would really help to provide alternative options. Um, I think the Emory Heights Rec Center, as uh, Coach Lou said, is a great um, neighborhood staple, but it's a little further off of Kennedy Street. So I think just providing a safe outlet through programming services, access to computers, job trainings, technical assistance through a library uh, would be a huge asset and hopefully work to deter some of the crime. Yeah. Got it. Um, and oh, sorry, I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, oh, good. I was just trying to get some consensus on where you guys were because we're hearing that is several different conversations had, but people feel isolated, feel not included, uh, not heard. And to Coach Lou's point, um, I heard uh, not even this commission, even the former commission um, uh, down southwest, southeast, um, in reference to uh, youth and advocating for youth, but they're not at the table. So how has, have you all engaged any of the local schools, uh, youth organizations, coaches, uh, current students or young adults attending libraries at all to involve them in these conversations? To the any commissioners? Um, I can only speak for our commission and if Commissioner Judson can add to this, um, she's welcome to do so. Um, I know that our predecessors, you know, did reach out uh, to Truesdale, to local um, daycare centers, et cetera, and they also drafted two uh, resolutions about this matter uh, that passed uh, unanimously. Um, and as Commissioner Judson stated, uh, uh, Council Member Lewis George is an advocate of this location as well. Um, and as Coach Lou did state, he agrees that this location would be beneficial. And uh, in real time, I um, received his contact information. So as a commission moving forward, um, because we're all new, we were all uh, um, 
sworn in in January. So we're still uh, trying to expand our our outreach to the community and come up with a you know more efficient game plan when it comes to that. But we are uh, really starting to to do more consistent outreach as we're um, gathering our our sea can legs, it, so to speak. Can anybody speak to the usability of the Shepherd Park Library? Okay. No, all right. I'll ask um, Director Gavin. All right. Because I think they had did some uh, data on usability of libraries, and this was in that. Um, wanna look at that as well. Uh, Mr. Mr. Oliver. Yes. Um, hold on, Mr. Pink, Ms. Commissioner Pinkney is also starting a library subcommittee. Um, Ms. Justin, go ahead. Can you speak to what that is? Sure, yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, so just to, um, to add to what Commissioner Cece just shared, Commissioner Pinckney, so is also brand new. We're all brand new to 4D. And she is really taking up this. She'll, you'll hear from her in a bit. She's going to be testifying. Um, but she is starting a subcommittee. Um, or I'm sorry, she's not able to she's not able to testify today, but is going to be submitting written testimony. She is starting a subcommittee to do exactly what you're asking, to work with the local schools, the local civic groups, the neighbor, everyone in the community to make sure that their voices are heard and at the table. And so I think we're just early on. It's uh, we very much value that and are going to be working to do that. And that's exactly why we've established a subcommittee to try and do some really intentional um, engagement. Um, around it. So Commissioner Pinckney is is leading that effort and there'll be more to come. Thank you. Um, thank you. Mr. Oliver, I know uh, you spoke at our last performance of oversight hearing, um, one of the previous hearings, and Director uh, Gavilan Reyes said he was going to have some further conversation with you. Um, and other stakeholders. Has that happened yet? Um, I would say it hasn't happened yet, but it's not so much Mr. Gavin's fault. We're all very busy and we've kind of been ships in the night, but we will be having a meeting uh, this weekend in which we will bring these uh, issues up. Uh, but thank you for asking. What, what? Can you give me the details on the meeting this weekend, if it's a public meeting? Uh, it's not a public meeting uh, per se. This is a uh, we're meeting with our um, board of trustees. Uh, one of the things that uh, the Federation of Friends haven't done very well is to get to know some of our partners, the board of trustees of the DC Public Library being one. And so we're gonna meet with them. We're also gonna have members of the um, foundation, which is the uh, arm that uh, brings in the funding and does the fundraising. So we're all going to get together and uh, talk, you know, it's more so a meet and greet as opposed to a business meeting. But during that time, uh, we can uh, talk about other things. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. I'm over my time for this panel. I want to thank you all for testifying today. I look forward to working with you in any capacity we can be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. For our next panel of witnesses, we have Rob Daner, President of Friends at Emil K Library, uh, Mark Patterson, President of Friends of Juanita Thornton Library, or Thornton slash Shepherd Park Library, um, Zachary Israel, Barbara Rogers, Renee Bowser, Rita Golden. Golden. Mr. Mr. Robin, you can go right ahead. Okay. Hello, uh, Council Member and uh, DCPL and all of the library advocates here today. Um, 
these are very serious matters being discussed. Um, and I think some of the things I intended to bring up might don't fit into the framework. So I will send you my updated testimony, Chairman. Um, but uh, just to begin speaking as the president of the MLK Library Friends, I want to thank the library. DCPL provided friends with a display cart in the Great Hall of the beautiful MLK renovated library for the sale of donated books. And I used to own a bookstore many decades ago, and I was very skeptical that this would work, but it's worked beautifully. And so people are donating money to purchase used books, and all of that money goes directly to the library through the friends for things that were asked for. So we really appreciate it. It was a great idea from DCPL. Uh, concerning the budget, the library friends recognize and share the concerns about security at our libraries. And we support all the funding requests uh, in this area and include, we hope, the Credible Messenger Program, which is an excellent thing. Um, I was extremely happy to see funding from the mayor for literacy teaching, and I hope that DCPO will be able to work with groups like the Washington Literacy Council to finally implement a recommendation 4.0 of the Adult Literacy Task Force, which I think was more than 10 years ago, to use our branch libraries to build capacity for literacy services for adults. And the Friends of the Library look forward to any volunteer opportunities that might come of this. I um, also just wanted to say that Axios is running a contest right now. You might have heard of it for the best building in DC. And as of yesterday, I haven't checked today, MLK Library was one of the four finalists. So I just want to thank everyone listening. We, the people who saved the building, which was going to be disposed of, sold off or leased. Um, but uh, the public outcry over many years saved it. And I'm proud of all the witnesses here today. Um, you understand, and council member, you are the government who is responsive. So um, thank you. And I wanna say, of course, the DCPL library, again, to its credit, embraced it and did a wonderful job uh, renovating the library into an award-winning and popular place. Um, I have one more minute to speak under my library renaissance hat. Uh, we support the comments from the representatives of Shepherd Park. We always like more libraries and we think both a refurbished Shepherd Park and a new uh, Kennedy Street Library would serve more people more readily than Walter Reed. We likewise support representatives from Southeast Library and I need to inject again a, a drop of history. I was present nearly two decades ago when the first four libraries in this extraordinary civic project of library transformation was begun. Uh, four libraries, Anacostia, Benning, Shaw, and Tenley were closed without any interim services. And this created a huge uproar. Not only were the interim services immediately, um, as soon as possible, made available, but the trustees resolved in public at their meeting that in the future, no library would ever be closed without interim services. So uh, it's not good to see what's happening with Southeast here and also the difficulties that Southwest went through. Um, interims cost money, we realize that, but I think we can all work together to, to make something happen in Southeast. And finally, um, I understand that the West End Library Maintenance Fund is being subsumed into the general fund in this budget, even though the law says it cannot be. Um, the maintenance fund was established as part of the deal of the West End uh, land disposition. And that this uh, subsuming of the money would even be considered is just further evidence in our view at the Library Renaissance Project that public-private partnerships don't work, they are not a public good, and they're not reliable. So I, I don't even know if this fund was used to restore uh, the library after the flooding last year, flooding that which we were promised couldn't even happen, anyway it did. Um, so uh, in conclusion, um, 
for what it's worth, please let's just stay away from public-private partnerships. Do not surplus Chevy Chase Library and do not surplus the land at 17th and U where a library has been proposed. And that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next we have Mark Patterson. Good, I believe I've got my mute off. All right, well, Councilman White, uh, Chairman White, uh, thank you for permitting me the time to speak during this hearing. My name is Mark Patterson and I'm the president of the Friends of the Juanita E. Thornton Shepherd Park Library on Georgia Avenue. When DCPL issued its next Libras Master Facilities Plan in November 2020, which called for the closing of our branch, the only full service branch that would be shut down, it did so without any outreach of any kind to the Shepherd Park Library service area. This could explain why opposition to a relocated library has drawn such fierce opposition. It could also explain why membership in the Friends, meanwhile, has topped the 100 mark each of the past two years. So how has DCPL responded? The fiscal 2024 budget shows that it still wants to build a quote unquote replacement library for Shepherd Park, but now in the face of a local budget crunch, wants to start it a year sooner. In January, DCPL Executive Director Richard reyes Gavilan made a presentation to the Walter Reed Community Advisory Council floating the possibility of putting that replacement library in Walter Reed. Now, it's too bad if the Walter Reed developers can't find enough tenants to fill up all the spaces they're building, but it's not the DC government's obligation to bail out developers in this manner. And the idea of putting a public library on private property should be setting off alarm bells. Advisory Neighborhood Commission 4A unanimously passed a resolution in February calling for an independently commissioned study exploring the advantages and drawbacks of both the current library and any proposed site in Walter Reed. DCPL's response to the ANC? Crickets. DCPL issued a Survey Monkey survey, which is still a terrible way to justify a $25 million construction project, asking the attitudes of respondents what they thought about library options, calling this outreach. Give me a break. It's not scientific. There are holes in the survey methodology big enough to drive a truck through. And just like with Next Libris, DCPL didn't do any outreach to our community before publishing the survey results. And the public relations agency had hired to choose the colors for the bar graphs and pie charts did not interview me even though its report says they did. Naturally, I complained. So what gives? Quote, Mark Patterson has shared his views about the proposal to relocate the Shepherd Park Library on multiple occasions and this opinion was incorporated into the summary, unquote. And this is from DCPL's own so-called Director of Community Engagement. Good grief, but at least they're going to remove my name. At the February meeting of the DCPL Board of Trustees, Reyes Gavilan said, and I quote, I don't know anybody who's building new libraries in this environment, presumably a reference to the COVID pandemic. Well, let me tell you who's building new libraries. Wuhan, China, for one. Another place, Brooklyn, where Reyes Gavilan ran the library system before coming to Washington. I'll put links to Wuhan and Brooklyn in my written testimony, and I'll slip it into the chat when I've got time to do it. Uh, to review, we've already got a functioning library in Shepherd Park of 25,000 square feet. DCPL wants to build a new library for a wasteful 25 million, of only 20,000 square feet, despite the coming population boom to Walter Reed. And because of their contracted PR firm has said that a new library for Kennedy Street Northwest is, quote, not in the conversation, unquote, a new library will be expected to accommodate those residents too. The Shepherd Park Library is two miles from Kennedy Street. DCPL's preferred Walter Reed site is 1.7 miles from Kennedy Street. Now you tell me how much of a difference those 0.3 miles are gonna make for access to library services. What we face is the specter of DCPL deciding what is best for, well, for who? DCPL, because it has still failed to conduct any authentic community engagement with residents of Shepherd Park, Colonial Village, North Portal Estates, Walter Reed, Brightwood Park, and Manor Park. That's 100% hubris, 0% transparency, and 0% accountability. 
Now, DCPL will always come back with the argument that the Shepherd Park Library is underutilized. Well, like now in COVID times, what about pre-pandemic when DCPL routinely treated Shepherd Park like the redheaded stepchild of the library system? Even given this treatment, the community's ask is relatively small. Give the Shepherd Park Library what had been recommended in Next Libris, about several hundred thousand dollars for a systems refresh, upgrades in HVAC, utilities, lighting, Wi-Fi, and internet. But the council should also find some way to freeze that 20 million, $25 million outlay for some far-fetched replacement library and DCP, until DCPL starts talking and listening to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Zachary Israel. Yep, yes, right. thank you, uh, Chair White and members of the committee. Um, I will be fairly brief because I've been here before. I was at your hearing a year ago. I was at your oversight hearing on February 1st. So I'm not going to rehash everything I've already said in those prior testimonies. Um, but I do just want to echo and repeat what um, the two ANC 4D commissioners said about specifically getting a new library at 5th and Kennedy Streets Northwest, uh, something that Councilmember Janice Lewis George supports and has been advocating for, something that Coach Lou, as you heard, he supports it. Um, the Brightwood Park neighborhood uh, would, would benefit tremendously from this asset. Um, the DC Public Library itself in November 2020, when its master facilities plan came out, directly said that our neighborhood needs a library. And yet in this FY24 budget for a new 4A library, and by the way, that should be relabeled a new Ward 4 library because um, Kennedy Street is not in ANC 4A, it's in ANC 4D and then part of which in 4B, um, but that's a separate issue. And alas though, that FY24 budget still doesn't specify, of course, where it will be, but also doesn't go into detail about how it's going to do community engagement. Now you've heard from Mark before me and others down in Southeast uh, uh, DC in, in both Ward 6 and Ward 8, there's a recurring theme I've been hearing. I've been listening to this whole hearing and it's lack of robust community engagement early on in the process so that everyone has a seat at the table, uh, both ANC commissioners, both you know the community at, at Emory uh, Height Community Center and the Brightwood Park community is another example that have just not been engaged in this process. So that leads to confusion, it leads to distrust. And so perhaps you know DCPL needs to allocate more of its FY24 budget to community engagement so that we avoid some of these issues and misconceptions about what is going on. Um, so the bottom line is I still support uh, this $25 million for a new library on 15th and Kennedy Street. And let's get DIMPED and the city administrator involved with the eminent domain process. I'm not an expert in that. I know it's going to take a while, but I would note that the FY24 budget for this new library, uh, 25 million, says that the uh, site finalization should happen, I think, fall of 2025. So we've still got over two years. There's still enough time. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, that survey monkey survey has, has been said repeatedly <laughs> from folks, it was not scientific. Um, and it's it's disheartening to hear that high level conversations have been had with the Walter Reed developers when that level of deliberation has not occurred to the best of my knowledge. And I've been the commissioner for months now um, for the Brightwood Park community. So, um, and, and I also just wanna end by saying that I also support um, funding to rehab the Shepherd Park Library. I don't wanna leave them behind. Let's do both. Let's keep that existing library and build a new library where everyone seems to agree we need it which is on Kennedy Street in Brightwood Park. Thank you very much. Got it. Got it. Um, Barbara Rogers. Let's see Barbara Rogers here. Commissioner Renee Bowser. I can see you got to unmute yourself. Good afternoon. I'm no longer a commissioner after 14 I years. That, but I didn't, I wasn't sure. So I just said, hey, I'm going to air on the side I, of call. <laughs> thank you. I hung that up. Um, but good afternoon, Chairman White and members and staff of the Committee on Recreation, Library, and Youth Affairs. My name is Renee Bowser, and I'm a Ward 4 resident living near Kennedy Street 
as well as Ward 4 Committee Woman on the DC Democratic State Committee. I testify today to urge DC Council to include in the FY 2024 and 2025 budget sufficient funding for the construction of a DC Public Library branch on Kennedy Street Northwest in Ward 4. On April 20th, 2022, Advisory Neighborhood Commission 4D, on which I served as chair, unanimously passed the resolution urging DCPL to allocate funds to establish a library in Brightwood Park. The resolution pointed out that DC Public Library's facilities master plan identified Brightwood Park as one of the geographic areas of the city that does not have the same level of service as other areas. And um, the master plan also stated that a new library in this area will address service gaps and relieve pressure on Petworth Library that has low square foot per capita because of population density. Kennedy Street Northwest in the heart of AMC 4D would be an ideal location for a district public library. The area described both as Petworth and Brightwood Park is a changing community where some residents have the fit sufficient economic means to travel to other basic services that libraries offer while others are struggling to remain in the community due to the high cost of housing expenses and other socioeconomic pressures. Libraries are basic institutions for healthy, striving communities. Like li libraries, like, unlike many other public institutions, are accessible to all. Specifically, libraries are free and open to the community regardless of language differences, age, economic status, mobility status, or housed or unhoused status. Libraries loan out books and allow people to use computers and study in a quiet location. Much more today, libraries serve as places of community education on consumer rights, local community history, job resource centers, and places where disaffected youth can learn the worth of their thoughts and power of their voices. And I wanna say one thing, when we talk about outreach, um, we don't have a facility that can reach out to all in our community. Um, for example, for uh, job resources, Department of Employment Services uh, attended our AMC and talked about they have information online for a commercial driver's license uh, uh, jobs and job training. Well, it, they didn't have a good answer in response to my question, how do people along Kennedy Street get that, get access to that information? As uh, uh, Commissioner Judson pointed out, we have the Ward 4 short-term family housing that they need all the resources they can get. We have had a home senior wellness center. They have such limited hours and they serve only seniors. So. Um, even if you're a senior, you can't go in there at six o'clock because they're closed. So we really need to have a resource on Kennedy Street uh, that reaches out um, to the community. Um, there's a Philadelphia library that provides a safe place for young adults from all backgrounds where they can build skills and explore issues inspired by reading books together. And I cite to that, um, that information. Also the Dallas Public Library, they do more to address the needs of per, uh, people experiencing homelessness and support the organizations working tirelessly to do the same. So I believe that a public library along Kennedy Street and AMC 4D can valuably serve the community, including teens and young adults. Uh, in conclusion, a Kennedy Street Public Library will help disparate members of our community engage resources for job, job training, consumer awareness. These services will expand the vision and voices of all, including teens and young adults, so that all in our community, community can feel they have a place as the community changes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Rita Golden. Not seeing her. Um, I want to ask you, uh, Commissioner Diner. Oh, President of MK Library. I'm sorry. How much money was uh, raised through donations for use for books and how many books were purchased? Do you remember? Um, well, the books are all donated so they and they just go out on the cart and it's an honor system where you see a book you want. So you put in some money. We have some guidelines for, you know, 50 cents for a paperback, a dollar for hardback kind of thing. But 
Um, it's all honor system. And uh, we, we've been raising about a hundred dollars a week. And I, I'm astonished by it. Um, is that that the question you ask? How much money are we getting? Yep. So I want to know just kind of like the community's input for collecting books. Uh, I think that's that's critical. We've done something like that in my office uh, with our literacy tools over the years. And we collected a lot of books to the point we didn't have any way to even store the books. And we got uh -huh. a lot of books from Virginia, ironically. Um, you, you talked to, in your testimony about public safety, in which we've heard from several different um, commissioners, residents. Um, what type... What type of public safety measures, if any, have you identified or has the community talked about as relates to in and around libraries and safe spaces? Um, well, I don't think we've had too many conversations about what to do because we're not experts, but we appreciate the extra training that the DCPL uh, security staff gets. Uh, and I think they have some special training that they actually give to the librarians as well. Um, I would note one thing, and this is just my own thought. Um, we have a, um, a code of behavior, published behavioral you know, standards for using the library. And I believe one of them says you have to wear shoes. And you may wonder, you know, well, what's that about? But we find that uh, people who are experiencing mental illness challenges or incidents sometimes don't wear shoes. It's almost a giveaway um, that something is going on with that person. And when I, I read, I wasn't told this, I read, and so maybe it's not true that uh, when we had the incident, uh, unfortunately someone was killed at the Petworth Library by a, a seemingly homeless person. I, I don't know fully the details, but it was reported that this person did not have shoes on. And so that can be a guideline, but if no one follows it, and, and how would you ask a librarian to intervene in that instance with someone who's suffering, you know, an incident, it may not be rational. So, I mean, I think we have a lot of things in place and we just need to keep thinking about it and make sure that the library remains a safe space. But, but from the point of view of the budget, whatever is needed in this area um, is supported by the friends. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to jump down for the sake of time. Um, Mr. Patterson, you spoke about Walter Reed being private property. Um, do, do you know about the design bill? Because I ride past that, see the ongoing development. We heard from Coach Lou and some other um, stakeholders in the community. Um, do you know if it remained a gated property? and closed out and not inclusive or open. Um, we have a project similar to that in St. San Elizabeth property. And we've been um, fighting to get the, the outside gates taken down, which is happening. Uh, I don't know where Walter Reed stands in, in, in regards to that. If, if you don't know if anyone can help him, I want to know that. My understanding is that some of the wrought iron gates going to be taken down, but others are going to be left up because those are more historic than others. Although. I don't know which gates are considered historic and which iron bars are not historic. Right. All right. Um, do you have any understanding of Shepherd's Park's library usage um, and any and compared to any other libraries? Well, right after Next Libras came out, we noticed that uh, it only, even though it was released in November of 2020, it's counting stopped with the fiscal year 2018. So fiscal 2019 was just missing. We were able to get that kind of information, which shows that our numbers were great, uh, you know, much better, uh, especially in a three year average. Uh, and when things come back uh, more toward normal and things were stopped being closed, uh, Shepherd Park was one of the first libraries to be opened because it had so much square footage and people could you know, not necessarily mix and mingle, but do their business at the library with a, probably a lesser fear of being uh, contracting COVID. Um, you know, we got back to uh, our, like 50% of our regular numbers a lot faster than any other library in the system did. And that was in 2021. Has that slacked off? It probably has. But, you know, there was also a time 
uh, probably in uh, the next Libris era where uh, staff had met its targets and still DCPL instituted cuts, you know, so you can't win for losing. Uh, that's why I think of Shepherd Park as a redheaded stepchild of the library system. You know, they say the building is old. It's 34 years old. My gosh, I hope that nobody thinks that, you know, I'm too late because I'm more than 34 years old myself. Yeah. <laughs> I know where you're trying to go for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I want to ask you, uh, Ms. Bowser, uh, why did you think a library in Kennedy Street would be ideal? You're still muted. Thank you for that question. Um, I believe because we have um, a changing community, we have a community that is very diverse, um, socioeconomically, culturally, and I think a library um, can serve to bring people together. Also, uh, there are so many groups that need library services that cannot afford to travel to other places. I think Commissioner uh, Justin mentioned the uh, Ward 4 short-term short family housing, which is one half block away. Um, but also, uh, we talk about the young men on Kennedy Street, um, and yet there are really no resources for them to, um, to, uh, to access. And the, um, the things that some of the people in the administration have done um, are not directed toward them. And um, there, aren't enough, um, there aren't enough violence interruption specialists either. But I think that the main thing is to grow people's um, sense of being and their sense of worth and their, their voices. And a public library does that. Um, yeah. because, and there, there are examples that I have in my testimony where that, uh, an example I bring from, from Philadelphia, where I'm from, where that has been very successful, a public library um, in downtown uh, Philadelphia. And, and because we, we uh, Hattie Home Senior Wellness Center cannot be a replacement because their hours are limited and they're geared towards seniors. You're supposed to be a member of, of Hattie Home Senior Wellness Center. So that's not gonna work. And many times, like we've had uh, the Department of Employment Services and other agencies out at our A and C meetings and they'll say, oh, we have this resource and we have this resource, but they don't have any practical way to um, link that resource to the people that most need the resource. And I know over the years, um, the, uh, University District of Columbia used to have a lot of adult literacy um, uh, funding and, and programs, and that has been reduced over the years. Um, so it would be good to have, um, uh, as, as someone else mentioned, uh, a, adult literacy classes right there on Kennedy Street, because we really do have uh, a community of haves and have nots. Um, and let me ask you this, uh, Ms. Bowser. Um, in your testimony, you talked about uh, Petworth Library capacity versus how many it serves. Can you speak to what those gaps are you reference? I can't. Um, you you might ask Commissioner Israel because he drafted our resolution okay. back last year. But the the um, the own the library's own facilities uh, master plan said that the Petworth Library was kind of overloaded because there's so many uh, people, so many um, people needing library service for the area that they're in. Got you. And I know uh, you can um, mute yourself, Mr. Israel. If you, I know Councilman Lois George just joined. Her name was invoked a number of times has been is in support of what the commission is trying to do um, and the community is trying to do. Uh, I guess I wanted to ask you, Mr. Israel, have you at all been in contact with the owner of the strip mall at 50 Kennedy? Uh, no, I have not. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's that's something that, you know, next step, certainly, and I'm sure Councilmember Lewis George, you know, has way more knowledge about that and her, her and her team. But I would just remind everyone as well that the budget says that the site finalization for this will be 
fall 2025. So there is enough time to yeah. have those conversations and come to some agreement on that. Also, Mr. Israel, in your testimony, you mentioned shifting the $25 million to this library. Um, are you aware of any costs related to this and how would uh, or how would you land or how would you shift that money if, if you could? Not you personally, but what's your ideal thought of shifting the money? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the way the the way that DCPL has like categorized this in their budget is a new 4A library. And, and all I was really saying was that it should really be defined as a new Ward 4 library because we don't yet know where it'll be. Saying new 4A library implies it would be within commission boundary for, of 4A. Um, which, which I guess could happen if they unfortunately decide to put it in Walter Reed, but we don't know that yet. So for just logical purposes, they, sh they should say we're for. Um, but, you know, the $25 million, um, identified, you know, in their own master facilities document was for a need in the Brightwood Park, Manor Park neighborhood. So let's allocate the funding there. And like I said earlier, too, um, we should still keep the Shepherd Park Library, too, and, and do what needs to be done there. But let's put yeah. the $25 million in our, in our area. Yep. And I think that some of these concerns are above uh, the director. Um, even when I hear about the Walter Reed project that's been in existence uh, for a long time, and I hear about some of the other projects, even through DGS, and I think about, you know, what I, the feedback I get as it relates to building, like what, what, what it costs to build something in 2022 is going to be different in 2025, as we see uh, the inflation rates, the highest has been since the, since 1980s. Um, so I'm concerned about that as well. I, I'm over my time. I'm joined by the War 4 council member, Janice Lewis George. If you have some questions for this panel or open a statement, go right ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, do my opening statement a little bit later. I'm, I had to chair another hearing on a, a legislation for facilities and family services, but I did want to come over and ask some questions to um, this panel, particularly um, because I think one of the things, Councilmember why I want you to be able to hear from the community is sort of the community, the the um, the what the community engagement has been thus far uh, from DC Public Library as it relates to the numerous. Uh, communities that this would entail. And so you have Brightwood Park and Manor Park, and then you have Shepherd Park. Um, and 4D is bright, represents uh, Brightwood Park, uh, and 4B represents Manor Park, and 4A represents Shepherd Park, three different areas. But I think there's a consistent theme that I think is important here. And so I just want to ask the panel to this question, sort of what has engagement look like uh, for your specific community as it relates to having a library as a resource in your community, uh, the proposal that has been proposed around Walter Reed, um, and what did you, what do you slash did you want true engagement and investment to look like from your specific communities that you um, you are from represent? And I'll ask this for all of the the, the past, the, the future witnesses as well. Um, so Commissioner Bowser, well, former commissioner, sorry, she is now free from that, that role. Former Commissioner Bowser, 4D, former chair, longtime serving 4D chair and long-term commissioner who lives in the Brightwood, uh, Brightwood Park uh, community. Uh, could you sort of elaborate on what, um, what that engagement has or has not looked like? Well, we have not had that engagement. Um, the... Um, Director of the DC Public Libraries was invited to an AC, uh, AMC 4D public meeting last year, but we've had no uh, consistent engagement about placing a public library. We did, we've had no full fledged discussion about all the things that um, um, a public, the ways the public library can, will serve. Uh, the closest thing to that was when we, uh, when there was the issue of, of, um, surplusing another public building, uh, Old Engine Company 22, That's and right. several people came to testify about the public uses. And they were, um, seniors pub, uh, uh, testified about that. Uh, we testified about Job Resource Center and so many things that could help the community. So there are so many things that are lacking, but the DC Public Library has not reached out to our community in any of the time that um, that um, I serve 
uh, it was exactly the opposite. The commission reached out to uh, the DC Public Library on that one occasion. Thank you for that. Yeah. And if, if I just add to what uh, Renee just said, um, you know, I just got my hands within the last hour on a letter that DCPL executive director sent to the current ANC 4D uh, about two weeks ago. And in the letter, you know, in fairness to DCPL, they said more immediately starting in April of this year, the DCPL outreach team will once again be going back to the Kenny Street short term family housing unit. Uh, business will begin April 5th and take place every other Wednesday as part of their community engagement. So I want to tip my hat to them. I think that's a good thing. But um, you know, if you identified a service gap in Brightwood Park and Manor Park, you need to reach out to the entirety of that community as much as possible. And that does re re require some some money um, as part of that. But, you know, you, they could, and it's, it's not cheap, but for a $25 million investment, do a mailer survey to all of the impacted residences and businesses in the area to get their, get real feedback, if that's what they really want. But the perception is that, you know, it, it really looks like they want this at Walter Reed and they use the survey monkey thing to help justify it. it was not scientific as many people have said and that's just just the wrong approach so th there's got to be a better way to do this and may yeah I add that, yeah go ahead may I add that in um, our community in ANC 4D you have people that have all the online services and still I don't know if you, unless someone reached out to you to tell you about the service you wouldn't know about the, this so-called so -called survey but there are many in our community that are not online and so they may need library services uh, services to go use a computer to help fill out a form for um, um, for for services or senior services but since they aren't online, they have their landline phone right. and the U.S. Postal Service. They never, they would never know about such a um, monkey survey, uh, mon uh, monkey survey. Yeah, and let me ask: Is were you, was your were your communities were they at, were they uh, sort of surveyed on Walter Reed? Uh, did you all come uh, have any? You know what what conversations were had with your community around Walter Reed being a location that would service your communities? Unless the new commissioners have had that since January um, when um, uh, Commissioner Israel and my term ended, um, we had none. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Mark, thank you for your strong advocacy for our local library. Um, can you say a little bit more about what improvements you would like to see at Juanita Thornton Shepherd Park Library as, as part of uh, your proposed refresh? Well, you know, the fiscal improvements would be key. You know, if you want new HVAC, new lighting, uh, you know, uh, better utility service, uh, Wi-Fi, internet, which is one big thing that people come to a library for. Um, you know, it took it seemed to take a long time to get a new children's librarian in. Uh, I guess despite the fact that there was a hiring fair with some on-the-spot job offers in January, uh, you know, routinely the neighborhood lists serve. We get poached by librarians from Tacoma Park and from Petworth about what's going on in their libraries. It's very silent on Shepherd Park, but they finally made that correction about a month ago, and we're seeing those kinds of things. But We've got to have uh, programmatic elements that will bring people back to the library in the way that people had used the library before and make it possible. Um, you know, if you need to uh, engage with your library in a more direct sense, yeah. you know, that that's the retail engagement. Your librarian, your library, with you as a neighbor, with you as a patron. Yeah. Um, I want to ask uh, one last uh, question to 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 uh, the panel of War for Witnesses. Um, talk to me about your communities. Like who, what, is, what, who is your community? What would, how would you describe your community, and how would your community uh, benefit from having a library as a resource? Um, I know uh, uh, Zach and Renee have spoken to Kennedy Street and their their surrounding neighborhood and, and seniors, but you're you're in the community, you've been a part of community. What what uh what is your community and the same for you, Mark? And how would they benefit from having a library a, as a resource um in, in their area? Well, you know, there's definitely a, an age gap in Shepherd Park. You know, there are some young families with children, and God bless them because 
they like to get to the library all the time. And I think that's the case with like every parent because we heard stories at a special meeting last night about how these people who are probably close to senior citizen age would bring their kids to the library. Um, but because of that, you know, they are now senior citizens and the older they get, the less likely they will want to travel further to a library because we may be half a mile from the Maryland border. We may be half a mile from uh, Rock Creek Park, but there are those neighborhoods that are west and north of Rock Creek Park where it gets, you know, treacherous just to get over to Georgia Avenue to use a library service. You know, so it's not, you know, what it's, when it's there, but what uh, when it's gone. Yeah, got it. Yeah, I, I would just add that, you know, I, I have a three-year-old and an 11-month-old uh, kid, and we love going to the library, but I wish there was one closer to us. We go down to the Petworth Library, it's further away. But, you know, if we got a new library in Kennedy Street, you know, our neighborhood, like Commissioner Bowser was saying, has been undergoing change for some time, has been experiencing gentrification. And there are divides, but I think that this type of community resource can help bring people together um, in, in some really significant positive ways. Um, and and that, that shouldn't be understated either. Yeah. Commissioner Rousey. Or Renee, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop calling you this. It was you were there for too, too long, many, too many oh. decades of service. I, I'm trying to get, get it out of my head. <laughs> okay. What was the question? I'm sorry. Just it's, talking about the community. What you know? Who is? What is your community? Who is your community made of? Made up of? Oh, it's very diverse. And um, why would this be a resource? How would a library be a resource for the community? Well, for one thing, um, a library would have um, information in many languages. We have. Um, people who are Spanish speakers. Um, we have people that um, um, are from Ethiopia and Amharic. Uh, and uh, we need to, they need to know what is happening in the community. And a library, someone could stay there for hours learning or figuring out what's happening um, on a um on a short-term basis and also longer-term issues. Um, it's a lot to, uh, I used to do a newsletter, but it's a lot to explain certain things to people like the lead um, free program because it's very, comp uh, for pipes, lead is complex right. about people's rights, um, about uh, other services. And a library is where uh, someone, even if they don't have computer, even if they're not, um, even if they're a new English learner, they can find those resources. And when we talk about new English learners, we're talking about people of different income levels as well. And we have to, even though um, we have people that can buy over million dollar homes in, in Ward 4 and A and C 4D, we have people that struggle to pay um, eight or nine hundred dollars a month for rent. So um, that's just one example of the diversity and the needs of, of our community. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanna thank uh, all the witnesses who already spoke on your powerful testimonies, including Commissioner Joan Hoyt, Commissioner Paula Edwards, Coach Lou uh, from Friends of Emory, former, and, and uh, thank you to Commissioner Bowser Israel and uh, Friends of Shepherd Park Library President Mark Patterson. Um, and I know Commissioner uh, Corny Oates, ANC4D and ANC4D Chair Kate Hudson was here as well. Um, Councilman Trayon White, I'm going to hop off. Um, I'm going to. You're probably going to get some more testimony. Um, I still do have an opening that I want to uh, do before we get to the government witnesses. But thank you to this entire panel, and thank you, Councilmember White, for your time. Thank you so much, Councilmember Denise Lewis George. And I'll ping you whenever we get to that place. I know you're in and out of hearings. Thank you. I know you support um, what they're doing uh, in Wolf Four. Thank you, guys. Um, our next panel, we have. Dr. Mayala Abdul Asaud. Saud. Uh, we have Rhea Ahmed. We have Kier Fernandez. We have Eddie Cohen, Jennifer Kunana, Riley Danyikola, Policy Analyst for DC Action. We can elevate those witnesses to the panel. It would be helpful for me.
I only see three from this panel. Uh, is Dr. Saud here? Forever. I'm it. Here. Okay, go right ahead. Uh, thank you for your time this afternoon, Commissioner, uh, Council Member. Um, my name is Afaria Ahmed, I'm, and my testimony today is to advocate for a public library in the Brightwood Park neighborhood, ideally on Kennedy Street Northwest. A lot of what I will say here has already been said, um, so I'll go through it very quickly. Uh, I've lived at Brightwood Park for nearly six years and have two young children that attend Truth Elementary. Um, both of them have actually learned to read by accessing the DC Public Library via the Libby app during the pandemic. We often frequent the Petworth, Lamont, Riggs, and Tacoma Park libraries by bus, bike, or car. We're fortunate enough to have a car to be able to do that. Each of these libraries are over one mile away from the center of Brightwood Park. We really do need a library here. A library on this commercial quote unquote main street in Brightwood would provide access to information, resources, not to mention tax, literacy, and internet services, and serve as a gathering place for the community. It would also drive more foot traffic to Kennedy Street, which would allow for a more vibrant community. On the corner, the corner of 5th and Kennedy, particularly, there is a bike share, a major bus line, the 62 and the 63, and it serves as a hub for the neighborhood. This location would be perfect for a library, especially since historically it's been a prime location for senseless gun violence. A library in this location would allow the community to take back its corner and the street for use by the larger, wider population. Um, this location is also between multiple schools, as was mentioned by Coach Lou earlier, including Barnard, Whittier, and Truesdale. Um, currently, as I mentioned, where my kids are enrolled. Having a library in Brightwood Park would provide these Title I schools with more resources to engage their scholars. I strongly urge you to consider the, a library in the Brightwood Park neighborhood, specifically on Kennedy Street, and I am confident a safer, more resilient community will grow. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next. Okay, Mr. Eddie Cohen. Thank you so much for having, I think a lot of great things were said, and I'll just say that I am new to this whole uh, government, app, local government advocacy thing, you know, so I'm a parent who lives in Brightwood, uh, well, Manor Park, I'm sorry. Um, I said we desperately need a library on Kennedy Street. So this testimony is really on behalf of the working parents who may not have had this flexibility or the social capital to sit and present on a Zoom today. I don't think this format is ideal for community, but I will try my best within three minutes. I think that Washington, D.C., and I know that you have these values, Councilman, should create a loving city and a community that's not just for economic prosperity. I have two younger kids, um, my daughter, Zara, who's three, uh, Zara, who's seven, Zuri, who's three. Um, Zara has an insatiable appetite for books. She attends Whittier, uh, our three-year-old attends Whittier. I'm the chess coach there. You know, um, they, they've won the math bowl at Whittier, and it's just a, a school with so much talent. Um, our family has one car. We do a lot of walking. We use public transit. Um, over the past month, we've traveled to Silver Spring Library downtown um, to Petworth for their spring carnival. Um, these are over an hour of walk from Kennedy Street to to get up to to. Um, to Shepherd Park's library and 45 minutes to, to pet work with little kids walking. Um, I keep getting from my daughter every time we participate something in pet work. She won the photo competition, ironically, taking a photo on Kennedy Street of when will we get one in our neighborhood? So to me, this is not just an issue about building a loving city, but it's also a fundamental exercise of, of, of what communities have high social capital and those who may not. So I have to say I had things prepared, but I'm a little bit envious when I listen to some of the presenters who rightfully advocate for upgrades or interim libraries in the short term or additional resources on top of already massive economic investments in their neighborhoods or, or their small pockets of under-resourced representatives, residents that, that need a library. You know, I took a walk down Kennedy Street yesterday. I'm there about five out of seven days a week. Um, with my daughters that we love every day Sunday. That's our favorite place to go, daddy-daughter time. Uh, and I, I love Kennedy Street. It is very vibrant. And from 3rd and Kennedy Street to Georgia, I counted, there are 11 liquor stores, 14 if you count the convenience stores, on the same stretch, right? 
So what value are we sending if we are saying we're creating a loving city and it is easier to get a beer than a book, right? This community, Manor Park, is resilient and our neighbors put up bookshares in front of their yards because there's an appetite for it. I love the DC library. I think they would agree that our kids deserve more than a pop-up library next to a liquor store. So I will close with you know the, the words that my daughter asked me, when will we get one? And I'll just say, I've also lived in Capitol Hill. I lived on A Street. I lived in Petworth in 2007 and 2008. And if I didn't know anything by listening to the testimony here today, I would believe that every community is struggling, that they are poorly resources. And we know that is not the case in DC, right? Some communities are getting $20, $20 million in renovations for their library. And you know, there's nothing wrong with, with advocating for specific communities, but how is that just? When we say that this council and this body represents equity, right? Um, I, I strongly advocate that you consider the placement of a library on Kennedy Streets. Um, we don't wanna take our kids next to a library by a liquor store. And I trust that you, Councilman White, and this committee uh, will use what you know and don't continue to perpetuate the unsaid structural inequities in DC by disinvesting in communities that need it the most. It is cruel to have us campaigning against each other for resources. And I was really appalled. The only reason that I know about this, I'm a parent, I put my head down, I got it from my councilwoman's newsletter, right, about this survey. And I'm like, a, a library at Walter Reed, they're taking one from Shepherd Park. I was appalled, right? Um, you know, and I know I, I have nothing against Walter Reed. They have a demographic that they're catering to. They have a private daycare. They have a Whole Foods that's coming. But let's not perpetuate inequity as we think about the distributions of resources in DC. Um, so so I'll, I'll just close with that. Please consider building a library on Fifth and Kennedy. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, still have not seen uh, Ms. Fernandez. So I'll go to uh, Ms. Jennifer. I don't want to mess your name, name up again, but go ahead. You. Member White, esteemed council members and committee staff. Um, my name is Jennifer Cannon. I am a resident of Ward 5, and I'm here today to share my experience at the Martin Luther King Memorial Library and testify on its impact on my personal and professional development. As a former medical device representative of over 15 years, I found myself exploring a career change and in need of new skills. As part of my job, I sold medical devices to hospitals, private practices, university medical programs, and was responsible for training physicians, residents, and staff on using my medical device. Well, my job provided me with ready-to-use PowerPoint presentations, contracts, spreadsheets, and marketing campaigns. I have, prior, I have prior experience with these applications, but I must admit that I've fallen behind a bit and in need of refresher courses since I haven't used them myself in some time and have grown out of practice. Therefore, I'm keen to improve my proficiency in these tools and keep abreast of the latest software updates and shortcuts. Fortunately, I discovered the MLK library offered free hands-on classes that taught these applications in a classroom setting. I was able to learn new shortcuts, software updates, and develop new skills such as using Canva and Google Docs. What made the experience even more valuable was the opportunity to collaborate and meet new people in the classroom setting. I was able to connect with others who shared similar goals and interests, and we were able to learn from each other's experiences. I extend my heartfelt thanks to the instructors of the MLK Library, especially Ms. Ann McNeil, for their patience, suggestions, and support through the learning process. Without their expertise and guidance, I would have been able to master these tools and feel confident about adding these experiences on my resume. I also want to acknowledge Mr. White, the librarian at the Woodbridge Library branch, for sharing the digital training calendar with me that allowed me to discover the classes offered at the MLK Library and take advantage of their valuable resources. I was able to attend classes that fit my schedule and focus on the areas that I needed to improve. Moreover, the library has been placed on, I'm sorry, moreover, the library has been a place of connection and creativity for me. I've taken advantage of the other programs such as the sewing class and knitting group that meets once a week. These programs have not only allowed me to explore my creative side, but also helped me form new connection with members of my community. I made lasting friendship with people who share my interests and values and I feel more connected to my community as a result. In conclusion, the MLK Library has been an invaluable resource for me and I highly recommend their, their programs to anyone seeking to improve their knowledge and skills. The library is not just a place for books, but a community hub where residents can connect, learn and grow 
I'm grateful for the library's commitment to providing free and accessible resources to all the residents of the district, regardless of the background, socioeconomic status. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share my experience and support the library's mission. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Rally Diniclo, Policy Analyst for DC Action. If you are in the waiting room, please raise your hand so we can know that you are there. Um, while we're waiting. Um, Gunanan, um, is Nadra Greenlee, uh, Andre, he Scott, and Mayor Crawford still They're on coming. The They're coming. She's coming. Yeah. Hello. Hello. You want me to start now? Yeah, yeah please start. Okay. Good, yes, good afternoon, Councilman White and other council members and committee staff. I am Nedra Greenlee, a student in the adult learning department, taking the basic computer courses at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. I wish to testify on my experiences here at the library. I am a retired RN in my 80s, and my last years of employment were very stressful because I had no computer skills. The company I worked for started use of computers with little or no training and indicated repeatedly that soon in the future, all documentation will be done on computer with no more writing on nurses notes or other medical records. All staff was to use computers trained or not. I was responsible for checking on computers, the nursing care that approximately 32 nursing assistants provided to 252 patients and residents in our facility. Fortunately, I was able to do this task, but in fear of when computer use was going to be used for all documentation. I retired before our facility went to computer use for all documentation, and it was with great relief. But I came to realize I still needed computer skills, even though I was no longer in the workplace. This rapidly changing world made me feel left behind. I used a computer at home only to use up information, to look up information, but was, that was all I did. My best friend told me about the computer classes at the library, and I was amazed at the ease of access to attend classes here without cost. It was very important to me that I did not have to worry about another bill. The staff here at the, the library made me feel very comfortable and welcome. All staff I came in contact with here were very professional and helpful and showed a desire for me to learn. I am also impressed with the many resources and information provided for our homeless, those in need of legal aid, our veterans, children, and teens, and the lab to mention a few. This library is a, lab, is a lifeline for many. I see the library as a valuable and necessary asset for our communities to remain strong and keep thriving. I am looking forward to continuing to use the library to improve my mind and body. I thank you for this opportunity and I am grateful. Thank you. Um, let me see if we have Andre Hescott with you. Is he there? Yes. Mr. Lee? He's coming. There we go. Hello, good day. 
Hello. Hello. You can start with your uh, testimony if you have one. Yes, I do. Good afternoon, Council Member White and other Council Members and Committee staff. My name is Andre Hescott, and I'm a DC resident of Ward 1, and I have lived there for 11 years. I came to DC Library to get help with a computer program, and in the future, I want to do it computer science. I also got help with my resume. I took the computer comfort classes that helps me learn the keys on the keyboard and going online. I also took a Windows 10 Word, Excel, and PowerPoint classes. I come here all the time to get access to all kinds of different things. I learned all my computer skills from the library in 2014. I took classes at the Mount, Mount Pleasant Library and I came to the computer class of the MLK Library when it's opened back up. Last year, I went to the job seeking clinic to get help with my resume to get a job. Mr. Rivera helps me with my resume and doing a job search. This helps me get the job with the company that do stripping and waxing floors and other different hospitals. I will keep coming to the library and motivate other people to come to the library to get it done. That is why I'm here. Thank you for Thank you for letting me testify. Yes, thank you for speaking. Thank um, it's, it should be one more with you on the list I have. Uh, Miss Miss Crawford there. Hey guys. Hello. <laughs> um. Good afternoon, Council Member White and Council Member and community staff. My name is Mia Crawford, and I'm a DC resident, and I do live in Ward One. But I come to the MLK Library only because of my GD. I'm currently getting my GD, um, preparing for it. I should say. Um, after 13 years, I like the fact that the city has options for us to receive practice before taking the actual GED test. It's free for us to take the GED practice test and have access to it. I personally love to um, the one-to-one -one tutoring sessions that I received at Martin Luther King Library. I can better understand the concept of Mr. Ben teachings. I took my very first math practice test back in January and I scored a 145. And over the time, Mr. Ben tutored me and I took my second practice test and I scored 156. Uh, I'm very satisfied with the services I received, especially taking the practice test free of charge, definitely free. Um, the staff are great and they are there when I need help with anything. So, but thank you. That's it. Congratulations. Thank you. That's not an easy test. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we're gonna jump up real quick. If that's is if is that it from this group, Ms. Kunana? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you if yes, it's this is it for this group. Okay, great. Um I want to start with Miss. Uh, Ahmed, um, just a similar question to when I asked before, um, cause I'm, I'm about this corner on fifth and Kennedy. I'm hearing about the trouble of the corner. Um, and I don't know what interventions, if any, is happening there. I heard, uh, I think Ms. Bowser say the lack of uh violence interrupters there or activities or programming there um just want to know from your perspective do you know of any other services that are currently been uh offered there to curtail some of the, the violence or um there's negative impacts that, that are there uh great question i know that that the stretch between fifth and seventh was supposed to be on um 
and I forgot what it was called, but a specific neighborhood watch safe spaces program. I'm not actually sure what the status of that is right now. Um, I live a block away. So I live on Fifth and Longfellow, um, a block away from Fifth and Kennedy. Um, we've my family, particularly um, my son, when he was in pre-K three, had to duck behind a car walking home from school because there was a shootout at the corner of Fifth and Kennedy. So um, I do believe that some sort of uh, I do believe that a library, which would allow more patrons and people to just be out on the streets and actually accessing services, would would not permit you know the 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 empty storefronts and people loitering outside um, and kind of unfortunately driving some of the violence. And then hopefully a lot of these young men would be able to potentially find the resources that they need to be able to get stable employment or or better their lives in other ways. Yeah, that. Yeah. Um, um, I wanted to also know, uh, at the current libraries, I uh, heard about some of the offerings like GED programs. Do you know what, what offerings of any that you participate in or anyone, you know, participate in at the current libraries in the community? I know that um, a lot of the libraries like Lamont Riggs had had a career fair. I know the Petworth has had a couple of those. Actually, the Emory Heights Center um, has done a lot of that work, uh, almost place, you know, almost taking the place of a library um, without necessarily all the books. But they but they do a lot of work in trying to um, try, trying to help support the community. I know um, our councilwoman, Lewis George, has also, you know, helped supported a lot of these job fairs and career fairs and um, and have worked with DDOT and other programs to bring them to Kennedy Street to try and recruit folks. Um, yeah, that's kind of the update I have. Thank you. I'm going to jump to Mr. Keon and Mr. Eddie. Um, based on the libraries that you've traveled to, what are, uh, what, what were you, would you consider some of the best ones and why, if you could compare? Yeah, so I'll say been to a lot of them, been to the one in Tacoma, been to um, Shepherd Park, Petworth. You know, I think we probably like Petworth because it seemed like they have broader based community programming. Um, and I just think they do a, a great job of putting the word out. I don't necessarily think traffic is a good indicator of the value of a library, though. I think there's a lot of things we can look at as far as hours of operations, et cetera. Um, Lamont Riggs is a good example, I think, of like a library that is really starting to inculcate community. Tuesday night, a bunch of us from Manor Park go over every night and play chess um, um, from International Master Adu. Um, a lot of our unhoused neighbors are there in that library, and I think they have a manager that's doing it right. Um, you know, I would like to see something like that in our in our neighborhood. All right. And, and how, what's the age ranges of those individuals participating in this chess? Yeah, so that's so I actually teach elementary kids, but this this is actually for adults. So these are folks who are from from college students that are at Howard who come to the community to folks who are 60, 70 years old that come every Tuesday. It's, it's co-sponsored by Ben Chili Bowl. Uh, and it's just a really good convening. And, and what you see is week after week, more and more people are starting to come. And I think the power of, of libraries, one, we're, we're in a book desert in Manor Park, first of all. Uh, but I think when we think about a physical edifice that helps to build social capital and a sense of place um, that convenes is, is what's key, right? There's a lot of talent in our neighborhood, right? We just need another space uh, to convenes. And we know our rec centers are overloaded. And I, what I love about the public library is its openness. Um, so the chess tournament for the elementary students, we actually travel all the way, including this Saturday, to Van Ness. And a building across from UDC to hold the chess tournaments at my office where I work because it's free, right? Um, and Whittier, you know, we go there every Friday, but try not to overburden the teachers by saying every Saturday you need to come there. So we just really need a space, um, you know, to to convene. And I think when you when you have something that represents light, you get more positivity to a community, right? Um, and something like a library on Kennedy Street would be, and I know I speak on behalf of a lot of parents who cannot testify today uh, will be well supported by the by the greater community. Great. I heard you say something um, that they have a great manager. I know we have some phenomenal staff at a lot of our libraries. And I think that's critical to making residents feel like this is my library. This is our library. 
outside of just going in there, sitting at a computer, doing your thing and leaving. And I think that I heard that even um, with those who are at the MLK library, experiencing different programs and classes. I want to ask you, Ms. Kunan, and uh, how, uh, how are people find out about the courses and the offerings from the library in your experience? Well, from my experience, I'm, I'm, I'm a chatterbox. So I tend to talk to everyone. <laughs> So I was just talking to like the well started in a Woodbridge library with Mr. White. I was just talking to him, telling him that I was looking into a career change. And I kind of like started talking about what I was interested in, more like, you know, a lot, a lot of like um just a lot of brushing up on my my software, my Microsoft, and so on. And he just like the light turned on. He goes, you know, Jennifer, um, MLK offers these classes and there's hands-free classes. And it's only down the street. You should check them out. And he showed me the calendar, and he, you know, and and that's how it started. <laughs> and then I, anyone else with you want to share how their experiences are with the uh, finding out about programs? There? And I think I cut you off, but go ahead, finish your thought before I go to. Oh, that. and and that was the same thing when I came here to MLK. I you know I spoke to the the, the teachers, the um the faculty, and, and they just kind of, you know, just kind of went ahead and grabbed my hand sort of thing and just, you know, walked me through it mm -hmm. and just supported me. And, you know, and I said, communicated to them what I needed. They just, if they, if they had, if they knew something, they would definitely share it with me and let me know. Okay. Thank you. Any other unique encounters about libraries and programs from anyone? Pardon one more time. Uh, I just want to know, uh, did anyone have any other unique encounters about engagement and programming happening at the libraries and how they were engaged. I've heard about the uh, yes, it just, GD program. Oh, the GD program. Give me one second. Let me GD program. I'm just speaking in general. I was using that as an example. But I heard Ms. Crawford talk about the GD program. Yes. Um, for me, it was, um, I have a case manager and she was just telling me about the GD program. So I just literally probably Googled it. And um, the closest library actually to me is um, Mount Pleasant, but they didn't have the classes, so I had to come to MLK. Now, I, how many people are in this class with you and how long is the class? Well, technically, um, I like like one-on-one -on -one tutoring because I get the better concept of learning instead of going to the schools. Um, so actually they volunteered their service to meet a tutor. So, so I just Mr. come ben, in. I heard you mention Mr. Ben. Is he a volunteer or staff? He is staff here. Okay. So you have mm -hmm. other people that volunteer as well? No, like for me, like they ask, they'll ask the people in the community, do they want to get tutored? And it's either yes or no. For me, it was yes. Got it. Okay. Great. Anybody else want to share their experiences? Yes. Yes, uh, I uh, learned about the uh, computer classes from a very good friend of mine. She knew about my uh, computer challenge. Okay. And uh, I was, because uh, we had checked out some classes that people were, playing, were paying several hundred dollars for. And uh, she said nothing. She learned nothing. And she told me about this place, this great place that I could not believe. She told me that I could come here, take classes for free. And the first time I came through the door, I felt very welcome. They had somebody at the door greeting you in, asking you if you could have, you know, if you need any help, even before you get inside the library proper. I was very impressed with that. So, um, like I said earlier, I intend to take advantage of this library and take some more more classes. And uh, eighty years old. Yes, I'm in my eighties. Yes, <laughs> so amazing. I need to keep I need to keep my mind active. <laughs> keep it fresh. My grandma used to say, "Keep your bread fresh." <laughs> yes, because right. if you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> right, that's right. We appreciate you for that, and I appreciate your advocacy, Mr. Eddie, um, and speaking to. Um, equity and access and just being um, heard. I think there are a population of people in the district that we feel like we're advocating for and we never hear from. Yes. And you can see the wide range of, you know, uh, uh, ethnicities to ages to genders here 
on this small platform. And I think I heard you say you, you don't feel like this is a conducive environment to hear from the community. I wanted to know, did you have any other suggestions on how we can better reach and hear and learn from residents? Yeah, you know, I think it's going to the places where we are, right? We're, we're at schools, uh, we're at rec centers, we're at churches, right? And at times that are that are conducive, right? I mean, we knew nothing. I, I, and that's, all the parents have WhatsApp groups and we communicate. No one knew anything but for Councilwoman um, Lewis's letter because her, her, her office does an excellent job of communicating and letting us know what's happening and that was, oh, what's going on with the library. So it's just some time of just coming to the actual place instead of making the folks come, you know, is, is, is something that we do. And I know there's various community meetings, you know, there's, I'm not going to say that, you know, the, the government does a horrible job at it. There's community meetings at Coolidge and stuff, but sometimes just during the morning, right, of engaging folks during drop-off, I think would be good to get some real-time feedback. Got it, got it. All right, with that, move, move my time for this panel. I want to thank you guys. Thank you. Very much. Thank you all. Time. I promise to keep my time um, to better be more responsive to Office of Cable Television staff and, and keep people to help us communicate with the public um, and also my staff too. Um, so we're going to skip right down to our next panel. Um, I think we have Sheila Carr, co-founder of Decoding Dyslexia DC. Mitchell Vanderhall. Paul Bergman. Julia Collison. Virtue Medema. Michelle Leparati, and we're going to try to put. We're probably going to have to pack this panel. Um, we we'll get through it. Um, Nariana Sama Singham. Marie Rende. Let's stop right there. I only see a few have actually came in. So we can kind of sort through who is here, who is not here. If you don't, if you heard your name and you don't see yourself on the screen, um, you can raise your hand and we'll be sure to elevate you. Oh, the basil. See you, big guy. Good to see you, man. Um, I see a few more people coming in. If not, I'll elevate the rest of the people to the panel. Um, All right, I'm not saying many more elevators, so I'm going to keep going down to, and I know some people try to be patient. This hearing could be lengthy. It's uh, 41 total witnesses, um, and I understand. Uh, Susan Sedgwick, Kelly Lewis, Kelly Roberts, Zach Pleasant, and Matt Crook. Matt Croak, the owner of Moreland's Tavern. Suzanne Sedgwick, um, board member of Capitol Hill Village. Okay. Liz Crawford. We're getting there. 
All right, we're almost there. Sorry for the wait, guys. Thank you for your patience. So now I have to try to figure out who is here from this original list. Okay. All right. Share the car. Mitchell. Okay, Mitchell. Nope, don't see Mitchell. I see Carl Bergman. Go right ahead. Thank you, Chairman White, uh, for this opportunity to speak before the committee. My name is Carl Bergman. I live in Shepherd Park. I've lived in Shepherd Park for over 40 years. I'm the treasurer of the Friends of the Juanita Thornton and Shepherd Park Library, but uh, I'm only representing myself today. I wanted to raise a number of issues that uh, add some depth to what some of the other folks have said. Um, for example, the service areas, as I, in my testimony, I show um, a chart, what the current library service area is, and then what would be added if uh, DCPL has its way, it would create probably the largest service area of any branch library in the city um, going down to Kennedy Street. And I think um, this would make it, considering that they propose um, a library which is about 80% uh, or 70% of the current library, um, I would not want to be the head librarian and try to come up with a program for this area. Um, elected officials. Uh, in January, DCPL ans issued answers to questions posed by the friends uh, of the library. And um, we asked one particular question and their answer was the following. The library will not move forward with a recommendation without broad support from the community and elected officials. To date, they have neither proved any broad support from the community. And frankly, uh, given the ANC's position and our ward member, Louis George's positions, they have not supported either of those or even acknowledged them. On study, um, the ANC adopted uh, the resolution, which I've, oh, you've heard of, which I've attached to my testimony. And what it talks to is that there really is no def definition of what the needs are in the community or uh, what best practices are for libraries, branch libraries. Uh, they haven't done any of the homework necessary uh, normally speaking, when you're building a facility, and I'm very familiar with this uh, because I've worked on the city's archives um, for a long time. I've, I've been a participant in the uh, Friends of the DC Archives, that you come up with the program first and you figure out which services and programs are necessary in a facility and what, how much uh, area they would need you then develop the facility based on that. They're doing the opposite. They're proposing a new library, which is smaller than the current library. And then they would figure out the programs and services for it, which is not a very good way to do things. The DC Public Library has no in-house facilities planning staff. They rely completely on consultants. Finally, about the survey that was done, people have said it's unscientific, unscientific and you've heard um, uh, Dr. Hargrove's um, paper, you've received that. And it's very easy to find what defines a reliable poll. And in fact, I'm sure there is in the library a book that the uh, DCPL people could have used to find out for themselves. I find it really remarkable that they have not done any of the type of homework that the library is used for by everyone else. And just for example, uh, I found in Encyclopedia Britannica, a reliable poll should indicate, for example, whether its results, results were based on sampling procedures that gave each member of a population a fair chance of being selected. 
and whether each respondent was limited to one and only one chance of participating in the poll. What that means is that when you just go out and ask people like a dragnet, oh, please respond to this, that doesn't give everyone a fair chance because there are many people who don't know about it. Uh, there are many people who may answer more than once. They can answer on paper. I figured out I could answer seven times without any trouble whatsoever, and they would never have any idea that I had answered seven times. Finally, DCPL needs to answer why it is so interested in Walter Reed. Um, I, I don't understand how Walter Reed could be um, a location that would be uh, properly served when they claim Shepherd is not. Just by moving the block, the library three blocks south doesn't make it more uh, usable. Why has it failed to look at other locations, especially where DC owns the land? Uh, finally, I call upon the committee to reject DCPL's proposed project proposal. The committee uh, should order DCPL to carry out the ANC's request and study the upper ward four. If they have to do something, if you have to do something, then leave Shepherd alone and return with a uh, an order to build a library in Brightwood, which I think is long overdue. Thank you, and I know I've gone over my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vanderhall. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Why assalamu alaikum. Alaikum uh, salam. Mubarak. Um, I want to speak on uh, the Brightwood community. First of all, uh, my family had been in the Brightwood community since 1968. We moved from Congress Place Southeast to there in 1968. My parents were a part of the lights on program during the crack epidemic in 87. And we've done a lot of things in that community as a family. Actually, I am the founder of the Friends of Emory Heights. Uh, we founded that when Charlene Drew Jarvis and Marion Barry was trying to turn Emory Heights Rec Center into a strip mall. And we all gathered together and we joined, the, uh, we started the um, with Diane Quinn, we started the Friends of Emory Heights to pattern ourselves after Guy Mason. So uh, as far as, and I'm a long activist in the community, as far as, you know, we I sneak in on these meetings sometimes that these uh, uh, ANC committees be having, and it'd be four or five people. They don't really reach out to us so we can engage and become a real solid community because most of us out here fighting these drug problems and these killings that because they're our kids and our people. So we out in the streets trying to stop this stuff from Kennedy Street on up to Rittenhouse Street on across to Riggs Park, you know, and our kids can't go in different neighborhoods because of the climate of the city now where neighborhoods are beefing. So, and just to give you a history, I would love to have the library at Kennedy Street. And I'm a person who I worked, I worked five years at Howard University Health Sciences Library. I worked at the Federal Reserve Law Library, and I worked 10 years for the Montgomery County Public Library System. With a library coming on Kennedy Street, what this is gonna do is gonna empower our neighborhood because if we get a good director, what a director, for a library does, it understands the conformity of a neighborhood. It understands what's going on in that neighborhood and it put the resources in that neighborhood to help out the neighborhood. You know, we can have access to free rooms for meetings. We can have access to uh, drug seminars and drug treatment uh, meetings. We can have access to uh, sewing classes like they do have at Petworth Library. We can have access to a recording studio for the young kids to get them off the streets. We can have uh, access to all the information that can empower the residents in this community. And also we have, like the gentleman said, all these liquor stores every other block and then more clubs open up. They, first of all, when we used to have a Safeway, which is now the Johnson and Jenkins funeral home, we got four funeral homes on Kennedy Street within a block from each other. 
And to speak about the Shepherd Library, my son used to live at 7604 Alaska Avenue with his mom, and he frequented the uh, Shepherd Library. If we put the Shepherd Library inside a private facility, which is it's a gated community, people don't have access to gated community. People don't have the resources and information to even know about such things that's inside of certain things. Even in our community, we didn't even know that such things like these meetings were going on because they're not being reached out to uh, everyone. You know why? Because we too busy, we fighting one thing that's more important, fighting to save our young people's lives. And we can't be at the same meeting to help and assist and let our community grow. So those would be the, that's a bit of problem. Like Ms. Bowser said, we had a chance to talk with Ms. Bowser and I, and, and she said there's not enough violence interrupters up there. And it's not the fact that it's not enough. It's not the resources is not being paid to the people that can stop the violence that's on Kennedy Street. We have done a lot of things that we stop crime that people don't even know about because we stop it before it gets started. And like I said, Coach Lou and myself of Emory Heights, we stopped a lot of things going on up in Emory Heights neighborhood. Emory Heights is the mecca of Ward 4. Emory Heights is so many resources come through Ward through Emory Heights, that we uh, help people, we help families, we feed families, we take care of the seniors. So this library will empower our community. It will, it will give us strength where it comes to the GED program where all these kids can't go across and get their GED because they can't go across town because of the beast. We have a section right there where we can use the library for and empower our young people. We can have drive training in there. People can go and access uh, information on anything that they will want because the library is uh, full of knowledge. And yes, information. Brother, Vettler, how are you uh, two minutes over your time. We'll come back to you with more questions. All right. Thank um, you. Before. Thank you. Appreciate you and your service. Um, we jump to uh, Julia Collinson. Julia had to leave the hearing uh, about an hour ago. And and something had to read for her. With your permission, uh, she did submit her written testimony to me, and I'll read her testimony into the uh, record if that's okay with you. Please do. Julia is an active member of our Southeast Library Task Force. She's the parent of two toddlers and she lives within walking distance of the Southeast Library. She wanted to talk about a large constituency of Southeast Library users who are unable to or too busy to advocate for themselves, children under five and parents and caregivers for those children. The Southeast Library is extremely popular among children under five. The library features a children's area with tables to sit and read, story times, sensory play, demand for indoors sometimes exceeds capacity. The library is also uniquely accessible to children on the orange, blue, or silver line because it's right on top of the Metro stop. There are lots of babies and young children living in the service area as evidenced by the number of daycares and preschools near the Capitol Southeastern Market, Potomac Avenue and RFK Metro stops. They are predominantly residential neighborhoods with dense housing, townhomes, condos, and apartments. Babies and most preschoolers under five don't have access to libraries at schools. The library offers an enriching, screen-free environment in a critical stage of development. It's also a respite for caregivers, especially in cold weather, and a place for new parents and babysitters to meet one another and form community bonds. Two to three years, when this library will be closed is a long time in the life of a preschooler. Kids this age who don't go to a library for two years will forget it exists. Parents who are currently expecting a child may never form a relationship with their local library if there are no services convenient to them in the next two or three years. Little kids love the library. Her son, that is uh, Julia's son, just turned three and signed up for his very own library card. He now chooses some of his own books to check out and has five books checked out. The Northeast and Southwest Library locations are poor substitutes for interim services close to Southeast Library. Caregivers can't walk more than 10 minutes with a small kid in the cold. They can't take strollers on the bus. The Northeast Library is not accessible by the orange, blue, or silver lines. Um, and there's little parking near the, the Southwest or Northeast Libraries. 
There are lots of daycares and preschools closer to the Southeast Library than to the Northeast or Southwest neighborhood libraries. Capitol Hill Daycare, Phase Learning Center, Storytime Kids, STEM are all daycares close to the Southeast Library. Tyler Elementary, Payne Elementary, Chamberlain Elementary, Van Ness Elementary, Brent Elementary, Watkins Elementary, The Hill Preschool, St. Peter's School, Capitol Hill Day School, Toddlers on the Hill, G Street, Street Co-op are all much closer to the Southeast Library than to the Northeast or Southwest Libraries. As a city committed to early childhood development and a pioneer in universal pre-K uh, uh, three and four-year-olds, we should recognize the importance of library services for our younger constituents and their caregivers and fund interim library services for the duration of the Southeast Library closure. Uh, those are the comments of uh, my uh, member of the Southeast Library Task Force, Julia Collison, who could not stay on this late. Sorry. All right, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, moving right along. Let's see. Miss um, Virgil. Hey, M Michelle Leparati. Hello. Hello. Hello, my name is Michelle Leparati, and I'm a resident of Southeast Washington, D.C., and I'm here today to express my concern about the lack of interim services that will be provided to my community during the library, the Southeast Library's renovations. My partner and I decided to move to Southeast D.C. because when searching for a home, we fell in love with the community, the walkability, and the access to enriching spaces, including the library. Now, when the library closes for renovations, essential services will be lost. But I'm not here to advocate for myself. I'm here to advocate for my community and those in my neighborhood that will be seriously impacted when they lose access to some of these services. We know that libraries offer vital resources for many and are a critical component in the well-being of a society. Computer access, educational resources, and document printing are just some of the essential services that have a significant impact on a person's academic studies, job hunt, or general well-being. Asking community members to use a library in another part of the city may be fine for some, but for others, it is not. I'm explicitly concerned about the access barriers senior citizens, children, and those with mobility restrictions will face when they could face up to a 40-minute walk to access the internet, print a document, or pick up a book. I, please, I ask you to please consider this closure's impact on the Ward 6 community, and actually other wards as well, and I invite you to work together in a and, and secure essential interim services, including internet access, even if it's just a few computers, book drop off and pick up for those that cannot walk to another library location, scanning, copying and printing throughout the Southeast Library's closure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Singham? Uh, here. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Sarma Singham, and I'm here as a, uh, a citizen of North, uh, Southeast DC. I'm here to advocate for interim services for the Southeast Library when it undergoes renovations for the next two to three years. I'm a first generation immigrant who grew up in the DC metro area. My public library offered me and my family English as a second language classes when we first immigrated to the United States. When I was a child, the public library was my second home. It was at the library when I first learned how to use computers. Because of my public library, I could afford to check out books that excited me and sparked my imagination. The public library was an integral part of my success in grade school. The resources I was able to tap into provided me with an opportunity to go to college. The libraries and college provided me an opportunity to graduate with an engineering degree and a medical degree. I recently moved to Ward 6 and learned that the local library would soon undergo renovations, which would mean it would be closed for up to two to three years. I'm worried about those kids, like me once, who relied heavily on the public library for education outside of school and home. I worry about those low-income families who cannot afford the books. I worry, about, I worry about those who rely on library computers for jobs, education, and communication. I worry that the lack of critical services over the following next years will negatively impact members of our community. 
I implore this board to provide funding for interim services while the Southeast Library undergoes renovations. As a community, we must work together to find solutions for, the, for our society to thrive. We are the closest library to Capitol Hill. So let's set an example for the rest of the country. Let's offer interim services such as mobile libraries, access to computers and printers, and a temporary place for, a community, for our community to gather. I thank the board for my opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, I can hear the fire truck coming. So I'm going to hurry up, call the next person. Um, Marie Rinde. I see Miss Marie. Okay. Susan Sedgwick. And I know some of these people were on earlier. Uh, Kelly Lewis. Okay, I see Kelly Roberts. So Kelly Roberts, you can jump right in. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yep, perfectly. Great. Um, well, thanks everyone for giving me the opportunity to join today. Um, I'm speaking as a resident of Ward 4. I've lived in Ward 4 for seven years um, and I recently moved to the Brightwood Park neighborhood. Um, I'm also a member of the Friends of the Petworth Library, but I'm here today to advocate for uh, a library in Brightwood Park specifically. Um, most importantly, I'm a parent of a one-year-old daughter who attends daycare at Fifth and Kennedy Street. Um, so every Monday through Friday, I walk up Fifth Street from my home um, to Kennedy Street to drop up and pick up my daughter. Along the way, I pass four little neighborhood libraries, which I always stop to check to see if there are available books. I can say with certainty that if there was a library at Fifth and Kennedy Street, myself, other parents and residents would be at the library every day to access wonderful services provided by DCPL, um, including books. Um, at Fifth and Kennedy Street, there's a variety of different types of people. There are parents picking up their children. There are younger, older people chatting. There are people attending clinical research trials at um, the building at Fifth and Kennedy Street, going to yoga going to Everyday Sunday up on 7th Street, and yes, as others mentioned, going to the liquor store. Um, just last week, there was a pop-up for free vegetables offered outside of City Blossoms, which is on the Kennedy Street block. Um, all that to say, there is already a community here of people who would greatly benefit from a central hub that would be offered at 5th and Kennedy Streets. Um, so as many have mentioned, a library at 5th and Kennedy would be able to service the 10 daycares and an elementary school that are within a five block radius, including countless others that are within an even larger radius that's just within a, a short distance from the proposed location. Um, there's also a family shelter for unhoused families right across the street, um, which I believe is one of the largest shelters for unhoused families in the city. Um, further, as others have mentioned, a 2020 study um, that found that Brightwood Park and Manor Park has one of the largest service gaps in the area which has a high concentration of individuals with low educational attainment, children ages birth to nine and single parent households, all of whom would benefit from a library at Fifth and Kennedy. Um, I can just say that the daycares themselves represent a wide socioeconomic spread from parents who are able to full, full pay to those who um, rely on vouchers for um, daycare. So you're talking about a wide socioeconomic swath of people that would benefit from a library. Um, again, as others mentioned, we're a mile from the Petworth Library. We're, sorry. Um, we're over a mile from Lamond Ridge. Can you hear me? And a, yep. Okay, go ahead. Yep. Um, and over a mile from the Tacoma Library. Um, also, as others have mentioned, there's the 62, 63 bus lines, as well as the E4 bus line. So this location would be um, a great location for a library. I see that I'm over time, so I'm happy to, to follow up with any questions or, or comments. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move to our next witness that we have here. Zach Pleasant. Yes, good afternoon and thank you for your time. Um, Zach Pleasant, um, I am a resident of 7th and Kennedy. I'm here to add my voice to the chorus of folks that have gone before me and have done such an excellent job of advocating for a library at 5th and Kennedy. 
Um, I just want to reiterate some of the things that folks have said. Um, you can see even through the people that have testified today for uh, Fifth and Kinney, the diversity of our neighborhood um, and the Kennedy uh, a Library in Brightwood Park on Kennedy Street would serve this diverse community with a space that you don't have to purchase anything to be a part of. Um, you go through and could grow yourself and which would in turn grow this community. Um, I think that it would just be a, um, we, we, we do have a lack of um, services or things to do um, during the day, and this will provide additional foot traffic and things um, to develop this community uh, in the Brightwood Park area. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's it. I just want to add to the course. That's the benefit of going last is, is that other folks have, have, have taken the words before me. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. I know you've been waiting quite some time to be heard. And sometimes I know how that is. You're waiting to say so much and so much has been said. It becomes redundant, but you still want to be uh, add your voice as a resident. You say you live a block away. So yeah, you're right there in the mix. So thank you for that. Um, I, I do know we have Miss Liz Crawford. Crawford. Thank you. It's Crawford, and I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak. And my voice, again, like you just said, it echoes what you've heard before. Um, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to say it. And um, I am a resident of Shepherd Park, and I'm testifying today because of my concern about the future of the Juanita E. Thornton Shepherd Park Library and the plan in the mayor's uh, budget to allocate $25 million to replace it. As a resident of Shepherd Park, we were surprised to learn about this plan about 18 months ago from the president of the Friends of the Library. Many residents have had questions about why this is happening, and those questions have not been answered by the DCPL leadership after multiple requests. We've been told that the library is to be torn down and moved or rebuilt at a different site. This makes no sense to us as there appears to be nothing so drastically wrong with our library that it would need such a dramatic solution. Perhaps some modest renovations are in order as they are periodically done at all libraries. We've heard arguments about it being too old or outdated with no further explanation. How could the city have built a library that's too old 35 years later? The Georgetown Neighborhood Library was built in 1934, renovated in 1976, and then largely rebuilt after a serious fire in 2007. The Tacoma Park Library was built in 1911 and renovated in 2009. The Petworth Library was built in 1939 and renovated in 2009. The list goes on. Most troubling is the knowledge that there is a clearly recognized service gap that we've heard about today in the library services provided to the Manor Park Brightwood Park community a few miles south. And yet DCPO leaders want to ignore that need and spend $25 million needlessly on our library. Why would the city undertake such an effort without communicating with the residents of our neighborhood before decisions are made? Could there be some hidden agenda that the city's not sharing with Shepherd Park and other nearby communities? Our council member and local ANC commissioners have made clear the positions of the community about why we feel the proposed action is a bad idea. And I strongly encourage the council and the library leadership to listen to the voices of our elected representatives. The Juanita E. Thornton Shepherd Park Library is a part of the fabric of our community. It is very dear to us for the history of how it was fought for and built, for its location of proximity to all community members, those with resources and especially those without, and for the beacon of opportunity that it presents to people of all ages, abilities, and incomes within our neighborhood. I hope that the legacy of the current library leadership will not be the extent of their short-sightedness in caring for the current assets they have. And I also hope that they will take seriously their responsibility to bring the multitude of benefits of public libraries equally to all of the communities of our fair city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for your patience. I'm going to swing back up. I know um, some have come and spoken and left, but nonetheless, we want to value uh, your, uh, your opinion, your input, and to Ms. Crawford, uh, the, the, the valuable data and analysis given and compared to other um, arguments that, you know, about the age of libraries. I think that's very helpful to us. 
Um, I want to go to Mr. Berman. She's still here. There he is. Yes, sir. Thank you for your patience. Um, you stated that there hasn't been any work done to determine the needs of the community. Um, Not really. The, uh, can you speak the work to that? that was done by uh, DCPL when they hired this media firm really doesn't qualify uh, for doing anything of, of substance because it was based on a survey, which is really just, as someone said, not worth the paper it's written on. Um, the type of survey has, is, has been characterized as President Bush, uh, the, old, the elder, referred to trickle-down economics as voodoo economics. These surveys like this have been called voodoo surveys because they really don't do anything. Uh, they appear to be alive, but they really aren't uh, worth anything to anyone because they do not let each person in the area uh, have an equal chance of being selected. I had a follow-up question to that. Um, have you, uh, have you, or anyone in the community, done a, a needs assessment from the community standpoint? Well, what we did was uh, the friends of the DC of the uh, Juanita Thornton Shepherd Park Library adopted a resolution. Uh, which in turn was adopted with some changes by the ANC, which says basically the community has not received the information needed for it to make any kind of reasonable judgment as to what it wants. And um, as a result, there's a lack of information for the types of uh, programs and services that are necessary in the ward. We really don't know what the community would like to have uh, in, in a modernized version of our library, if, if, to use the um, DCPL's term for it. Got it. Um, I want to thank you. I want to jump real quick to thank Mr. Vanderhall. Uh, you have been a pillar uh, in this community, as, as you talked about, I guess, since back, your family history goes back to 1968. And you've seen a lot of transition in the community. I know your efforts and work uh, was some of the, I don't want to even call them at potential. I mean, at, at risk, we call them at potential uh, individuals in this community. And I know there are residents who uh, want to see a change in the community, but we want to make sure the change includes everyone. Uh, I want to know from your perspective, how would a healthy, what's your idea of a healthy uh, change in this community that's inclusive of this library with the residents and with input from everybody. And I heard people some from, from this side of that side, but from all sides. Well, what, what would be a good uh, community, uh, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, is, is that if all of the uh, new people who move into the neighborhood work with the old people that's been there working in the neighborhood, you know, we don't have a problem with them. It seems like they have a problem with us. We want the same thing that they want. We want a good, vibrant, peaceful community because our community has been like that before, you know, but it seems like our community is caught into like a quagmire. We're between a rock and a hard place where we are uh, too good to get resources and then uh, we're uh, too bad to not get some. So we we between a rock and a hard place where we get left out all the time, you know. And it's time that we empower ourselves. They've been taken from our community for years. They've been taken from the people in our community, and our kids are suffering behind it. Our kids are really latching out because they don't have no resources themselves. So and and by their parents having to work, both parents have to work. Some got one parent in the house, so it's hard to keep your kid in line when you're out working and 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 you living below the poverty level, but you're living in a, a so-called middle class neighborhood. You know, so we have to come together and we have to support each other in our community. You know, because we have to go back to like the old African proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. And the children are our natural resources, and, and we have to. Uh, you talked about the village, and you and even in your testimony, 
Uh, you talked about your experience with uh, the Health Science Library, the Montgomery County Systems Library. But one thing, key thing you said, you said this 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 library would empower the neighbors. How does empowering the neighbors and the community village model tie into, in your opinion? Well, the lab because the library will give us a chance to. We can have community meetings there. We can have a GED program there. We can have a workforce development there. You know, the library will help people come there. They can look to the library. And a lot of people are illiterate. They can't read. A lot of these young kids can't read out there. So this library will give them a chance where they can be into a literacy program, you know, and then they can further their education and feel good about themselves. They can empower, like the brother say, it's a chess program and that chess teach strategy of life. You know what I'm saying? That, that same program could be in our community. You have a daycare. You got five or six daycares on Kennedy Street that these kids can have reading programs and grow up. You know, uh, what they say, uh, ounce of prevention prevents a pound of cure. So we have more resources to help. And also then this would be a safe place as well as Emory Heights to meet with our constituents and our uh, neighbors who don't want to meet with us, who have in these private meetings. Now we have, a, they can put a sign up in the library and they can feel safe to go to the library and then they can feel safe to meet with us. Got it, thank you. I'll come back to you if I have any other questions. I want to jump to, um, who was it? Um, is Singham gone? Okay. So I'll skip around. Um, Miss Miss Roberts, uh, do you know the distance of the four libraries uh, and the, the different difference in resources? I'm not sure about the difference in the resources, but I think in the study from 2020, it was 1.1 miles to Petworth Library from Fifth and Kennedy. 1.3 miles to Lamond Riggs. Now that's along Missouri Avenue. So that's, you know, a busy thoroughfare. Um, yeah. 1.3 miles to Tacoma Park. And I'm not sure what Shepherd Park is, but it's further than Tacoma Park. Okay. And, uh, and from what I'm hearing from you is, is, is the need for this particular library is needed because this is too far, especially relates to those seniors, those who have challenges walking and bus routes. Is that accurate? So the, it's actually a convenient location for bus routes, but there's not a direct line from Fifth and Kennedy to the Petworth Library or to Lamont Riggs or to Tacoma. Okay. So it, it is convenient for people in the neighborhood to get to the proposed location, but not to the other libraries. Gotcha. Um, thank you for that. They want to get some clarity on that. Ms. Crawford, what do you think is the driving force as or hidden agenda behind the library in Walter Reed. And let me just say this, you, you know, I, I thought about that because I, I, as a council member, I'm in a lot of meetings about development. And I do know that one of the things that people want to get that they bank their development deal on that most people can't get and won't get is a government contract because those government contracts are normally 99 years. That means that the government is was going to be around for 99 years unless uh, the world ends, going to be paying uh, for this public space for a long term and people base their deals off of that with the bank. That's a lot of leverage. And I don't know what happened with this deal. I'm not involved in this deal at all. It's not in my war, but I have seen this uh, leverage. When you talk about 25 million used to get other funding to do a large parcel of development. And I don't know what you were alluding to, but I just wanted to put that out there because I was thinking about, you know, you know, I heard some of the testimony from the director. He seems like he's hearing from the community. He says he's committed to come back and, and having dialogue with the commissioner from our last performance oversight here. And I believe him. Um, but I wanted to hear from you. What do you think is happening? Um, that's a great question. And I, I don't have an answer with any real evidence. I really have simply speculation. And it's based on two things. When when we first heard this concept that they were going to replace our library and move it, in the wording somewhere in, in the document that I think Mark Patterson sent around was something about the library had come to the end of its useful life. And I was like, what? It's a building that's 
35 years old. What I mean, the way they phrased it was incredulously absurd. It's like, as I said, there's plenty of libraries that are 100 or 200 years old. The buildings, yes, you remodel them, you make them uh, fit the times. But it, it, the wording of the reason that was given in the language was, to me, absurd. And it was like, okay, intelligent people wouldn't say that. There must be something else going on here. And and I, I don't mean to sound rude or offensive to those people, but that's kind of how it came across to us. And what we do know, of course, is on three sides of that building is a lot of development. The Walter Reed development is going on with thousands of new residential properties, and then immediately adjacent to the library, um, some affordable, I think it's 100% affordable housing is being built. And so a developer has torn down the existing older buildings and is building new affordable housing right next door. So you're kind of left going, oh, all right, does somebody have designs on the parcel that's the existing library? And if so, why is that not part of this conversation and, and people being open about it? So that's sheer speculation on my part, but those are what we see in the community of why are they proposing this? It doesn't make sense. What's really going on here? Yeah, sure. I appreciate your, your candid response. I appreciate that and insight. Um, I'm a minute over my time. Um, uh, Les, Miss Miss. Crawford, you given the lack of communication, as you noted, between DC public libraries and the community, um, do you feel that there's uh, from the the library leadership that they they are open to further conversation to try to get this right, um, or do you believe that they are doing the right thing uh, based on uh, some of the feedback you've seen and heard from the administration? Um. I, I don't feel qualified to answer that. I think that um, our friends of the library administrators are, are better equipped. The little contact I've had is they don't seem very responsive. My ANC commissioner, Joan Hoyt, has been reaching out to them, as has Mark Patterson, and they're not getting answers. And so it's leading us to, to question what, what can they do differently? And I, I reiterate the survey that they sent out was certainly not a representative set of answers to, to the community's needs. So I think more could be done, but I- no, but sorry, rather... Did you have a, a response to that? And anybody got a response to that? If not, that's okay, we can move on. Just want to check and get the temperature going into the government witnesses portion of the hearing. All right. All right, guys, thank you um, um, for your, your dedication and service to the district and being a voice uh, for those who may not even know this is going on today, advocating for need to address, you know, uh, adult and youth literacy, not just uh, even including financial literacy. Libraries encompass a variety of topics, themes, and concepts that can be big, bring people together who may not normally be in the same space or even communicate. Um, so I think that libraries are an important uh, vein to DC's uh, bloodline. So I think that we have to figure out a way to make this work for everyone. Um, I know we have the right people at the table advocating and intervening. Um, and so I want to thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, I'll digress for a moment. And Council Member Janice Lewis, George from World 4, I know you had an opening statement. Do you want to do it now or do you want to wait? Um, I can do it, um, but I wanted to say to this panel first to thank this this outstanding panel of of um, witnesses from very community various communities. I just love that it is you hearing from Brightwood Park, Manor Park, Shepherd Park. Like this is this is like War Four saying we want we want resources for our communities, um, our diverse communities that need the support and the resources. Um, and I think everyone answered your questions already so thoroughly regarding what it would mean to the community and why this would be a necessity for the community. Um, and so I, I want to appreciate the questions you asked Councilmember Trayon White um, in, in regard to that, uh, the public safety concerns that have been raised, the support services for, for families and young children. I'll say this summer we had a pop-up, we had pop-up libraries at, in, in um, on Kennedy Street and families showed up in numbers, in droves. Um, 
and they were just and they were so happy to to have that resource and they and they showed up in a big way and i think what um what mitch is was speaking about is like this is a village this is a community um and, and we have the ability to do the right thing here so i want to just thank i want to thank everybody this panel of witnesses who showed up for our community and 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 we are in that um in that fight i will give if you want me to do it now i can give my opening are you going to do government witnesses coming up next Yes, government witnesses are. Okay. okay, so let me just say this. I want to thank you, Councilmember White. Um, I'm grateful for your leadership and your focus as equity as chair of this committee. Um, I support the plans that are taking shape for the, the Petworth Library, uh, and I'm grateful for the beautiful new library in Lamar Riggs. Um, but I'm going to focus both my remarks and my questions on the plans for future library facilities in War 4. Uh, these plans are represented in the budget by a proposed 25 million capital project to construct a new library somewhere in War 4 to serve the Shepherd Park, Brightwood Park, and Manor Park communities is what the current language says. As you heard from several ANC commissioners and residents during today's hearing, we are disappointed by how DC Public Library has chosen to engage around a new library. Our community deserves transparency, genuine engagement, and for the agency to truly listen to neighbors about what they need. Instead, every indication we have received from DC Public Libraries is that DC Public Library wants to close the Juanita E. Thornton Shepherd Park Library and replace it with a newly constructed library on the former Walter Reed campus. And the flawed lopsided survey that DCPL recently conducted is another example of how DCPL is exclusively focused on putting the library at Walter Reed. To our community and to my council colleagues, I wanna be clear, this plan, as that as stated, fails to do right by our communities in Shepherd Park, Brightwood, Brightwood Park, and Manor Park. I do not support that plan at all. And I and I and now the budget has come to the council, and we should ex exercise our power to meet our city's full needs and not pit our communities against each other. Um, I want to break this down first. DCPL's analysis of Shepherd Park Library and why it needs to close is fundamentally flawed. Many of the reasons were raised by our public witnesses already, but I want to highlight another flaw. Uh, DCPL's analysis in their facility plan relies heavily on square feet per capita to compare the physical size of a branch library to the population of its service area. But the facilities plan incorrectly defines the library service area in Shepherd Park, relying arbitrarily on census tract boundaries that wrongly exclude much of ANC 4A including the entire Walter Reed campus where we will have thousands of new residents. If you correct, if you correct for this error, Juanita Thornton square foot per capita measure is in line with many other DC libraries. But zooming out from the numbers, let me clearly say Shepherd Park needs a library. And instead of demolishing the library that is already in Shepherd Park and serving our community to move it somewhere else, we need to keep this community asset and make the improvement it needs to be an even better place for our neighbors to come learn, gather, and better their lives. At the same time, DCPL can no longer ignore the massive service gap and the strong need for library services on Kennedy Street to serve Manor Park and Brightwood Park. We are talking about an area with a high concentration of immigrant families, single parent households, children ages birth to nine, schools and child care centers, lower income families, residents who need jobs, and senior citizens. DC Public Library knows this because its own master facilities plan identified this service gap. The safest communities are the ones with the most resources. The truth is that Kennedy Street has been systemically underinvested in over decades, contributing to the violence we see now. We have the opportunity to turn the corner by building a new war for a new war for library on Kennedy Street and bringing a real public resource to our community. So it stops being easier to buy a beer than it is to get a book on Kennedy Street, as we heard uh, from witnesses today. It is a space where people can come, like commissioners and, and, and community members have said, to apply for jobs, uh, to get language access, to have air condition in the summer and, and heat in the, in, in the winter, uh, to have uh, community meetings to bring us together so we can do that gap, to give student support help, to help them with their homework, uh, to have uh, our diverse needs met as a community. Uh, and to really give an opportunity to the, the members of our, our community in Brightwood Park and in Manor Park and Kennedy Street, where I grew up. 
So I want to thank you again to every community member for your powerful testimony, um, to Councilmember White uh, and to the members of the Recreation Libraries and Youth Affairs Committee. I want to say, let's work together to get this right. We all know how inequities persist over and over again in communities. And when people are set on a development deal versus supporting the communities and hearing from the communities uh, outright and saying what we need, what we want, and what we what we want to do for our community. And so I, I hope to engage you, uh, Councilman White, the members of this uh, committee and for DCPL, because I do want us to work together because this is a win for all of us. This is a space, I think, where DC Public Library has done great uh, has been doing great uh, content at the MLK Library. Uh, they have have a, a a Black Feminist in DC exhibit that I just visited, and it talked about Black women leaders in this city who are fighting for the same thing I'm fighting for right now as a Ward Four Council Member leader, as a Black woman in the city, saying this is a community that has been. Uh, underinvested, underserved, and to take a resource and to say a resource belongs in a new community where development is happening and to ignore a community that has been begging and, and crying for a resource and for government to care about them. This is the way to show in their values that they have been putting forward in community meetings and conversations that that's what they believe in. The Juanita Thornton Library is named af after a, a, again, another Black woman leader and family. The Shepherd Park community is a diverse community of historically Black families and Jewish communities and families, and they're saying, we want this entity. So at what point do we put our community first? At what point do we stand on our values and say that this is the right thing to do and that DCPL values is in line with the values of this of our communities and of our city and of our leaders. And I think a better path is 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 welcome. I think a better conversation is welcome. And I think a better path forward can happen um, in this budget and moving forward. So thank you, Councilmember Tran White, for allowing me this time and for listening to and engaging with our community members who testified today and who have written uh, and test uh, testimony and submitted it to you and, and your staff. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your dedication. Um, to these and other issues related to libraries, you've been at, a, at all the hearings in one capacity or another and in the community just listening and advocating as well. So I want to thank you, uh, Councilman Janice Lewis George. I'm going to move to the government witnesses. Uh, let me see if you can elevate the government witnesses. I believe there are a few that I saw. Um, I think we had, um, of course, Director Richard Reyes Gavilan, um, Joy Mix, um, Barbara Jumper, Tiffany Austin, and Cheryl Bacana. Um, If they are here, you can elevate them to the panel. We ask that all government witnesses be sworn in. So we're going to ask that you uh, turn your camera on. And while we're doing that, we're going to take a, a, a one minute break as we transition. Good afternoon, Director um, Gavilan. We it is the uh, the practice of this office to swear in all government witnesses. Um, I see four of you guys. Would that be it? I think there's five with our AFO. Okay, I see four. I'm sorry, I'm not sure who's missing. Okay. Our Hi. director of public service is missing. She's probably, she's here, so I don't know where she is, but um, she's likely not going to testify, so I'm happy to proceed um, with this group. Right. Okay, great. Um, if you all can raise your right hand and cut your screens on. Okay, you already have your screens on it. And unmute yourself. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give today to the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. All right. I see 
Okay. I see, Director, you have a lot of strong women around you. You must took notes from what Councilmember Janice Lord Jules was saying ahead of time. I'm um, not that dumb. <laughs> All right. Um, you can start with your uh, opening statement if you have one or presentation and we'll go from there. Um, before you get started, I do want to find out from you've had somebody look up who who did the survey. I heard someone say we contracted a communications team to actually commission the survey. We can get that and put that in the chat um, in, the, in the interim, but go right ahead, Director. Yeah, it's a link strategic partners. They're a very well known communications firm in the city that we've worked with before and highly reputable firm um, that works here. In any event, um, so I can get started. Great. Um, good afternoon, Council Member White, uh, members of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries and Youth Affairs, uh, committee staff and um, Council Member Lewis George. Uh, I am Richard Reyes Gavilan, Executive Director of the DC Public Library. I am pleased to submit uh, testimony this afternoon regarding Mayor Bowser's proposed fiscal year 2024 budget. Um, I'd like to thank you for your ongoing support of the DC Public Library. I would like to also thank Mayor Bowser and her team for the proposed FY24 budget, which demonstrates support for public libraries despite the local economy's projected downturn. Um, I offer appreciation to the Board of Library Trustees under the leadership of Chair Antonio Tony Williams for its oversight and guidance and to the supporters and advocates of the library, including the friends groups of the DC Public Library and the DC Public Library Foundation. Lastly, and most importantly, I offer my deepest thanks to the staff of the library who continue to meet the needs of residents despite the ongoing challenges facing our communities. Overall, the mayor's proposed FY24 operating budget of $75.3 million represents a 2.3% decrease compared to the FY23 operating budget. The decrease includes the elimination of 18.5 vacant positions and across the board decreases to the library's non-personnel services budget. While not impacting DCPL's hours of service, the budget and FTE reductions will result in a degradation of the services and experiences to which residents have come to expect from DCPL. The eliminated FTEs primarily serve support functions that will impact the speed with which we hire new staff, how well we conduct community outreach, how much we can support the DCPO website and other, other popular online services, and how efficiently we maintain our technology and deploy it to public and staff. The loss of $433,410 from the DCPL revenue generating activities will result in a significant decrease of special events, exhibitions, and programs at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library and a loss of related custodial services and upkeep that support these events, exhibitions, and programs. All this is being proposed at a particularly inopportune time. Visits to the new MLK Library are at an all-time high. 59,000 people visited the building last month alone. Overall, there has been an 88% increase in visits to the MLK Library in the first half of FY23 compared to the first half of FY22. Compare that to the 1.7% overall decrease of visits to neighborhood libraries during the same time frame, a decrease that occurred despite our FY23 increase in hours that began in November of 22. Uh, the DCPL Board of Trustees has specifically earmarked the Revenue Generating Fund to support cultural programs and exhibits at MLK, in addition to supporting additional upkeep of the building as wear and tear is already becoming a visible byproduct of the building's extraordinary success. Similarly, the loss of $629,442 in custodial maintenance funding and the repeal and loss of the West End Library Firehouse Maintenance Fund, which is held in the budget of the Department of General Services, will require DCPL to stretch its reduced maintenance budget even further. In addition to reduced cleaning, the funding loss will also result in reduced pest control and landscaping services. Um, the Capital Improvement Plan provides continued funding to support the design and construction of the libraries replacing Chevy Chase, Deanwood, Northwest One, and Rosedale, as well as the new library in Congress Heights, replacement for Shepherd Park Library. In addition, the Capital Improvement Plan includes an additional $10 million for the expansion and modernization of the Southeast Library to account for increased costs to inflation. I'm particularly grateful to the mayor for this proposed increase, 
without which this complex project could not move forward. There's $4.8 million uh, for general improvements necessary for ongoing small capital projects and emergency repairs, and $600,000 for new vehicles to replace an aging fleet, including vehicles used by our, our public safety staff as they travel among our 26 locations. So thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to provide this brief testimony. I'm joined this afternoon by members of the library's executive management team and our agency fiscal officer, and we welcome any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, Director. And we'll start with uh, round one. Um, your FY24 operating budget decreased by roughly 2.3%, which is equivalent to 1.76 million. Uh, how would this shift in, in funding of, affect your ability to be efficient and effective as an agency? I think, uh, you know, council member, that's, I, I opened up my testimony with as probably a high level description of what that decrease would mean. Um, you know, it's gonna, it won't impact our hours of service. I mean, you know, we can stay open whatever number of hours we're open now, but, you know, the community expects, you know, um, our technology to be re refreshed, uh, you know, over, you know, X number of years, um, uh, you know, three years instead of four years or four years instead of five years. Um, you know, they expect um, community outreach. You've heard a lot about that today. They expect our website to be working, um, you know, perfectly. And, uh, you know, a loss of some of those um, FTE and some of those, and some of that non-personnel budget is going to basically just result in a, in a, a degraded, I guess is the, the term I use, a degraded experience across across the library system. Yep, thank you. Um, what, can you describe what this line item is? Is called your special purpose revenue funds? What is this fund and what is it used for? Yeah, special purpose revenue basically um, includes a number of things, including E-rate, which is the technology funding that we get as part of the FCC program. It also includes the revenue that the library generates through the, um, the uh, space rental program up at the MLK library. And so right now we are looking again at a loss of um, about $433 from our revenue generating fund, but the special purpose funding, I'm sorry? You said $433, it looked like $400,000. No, $433,000, yeah. That's right. Um, Director, there was a lot of conversation about, uh, the, I would call it the War Four Library. Yes. Um, and I see there's $25 million allocated. Uh, and there is a lot of concern about the communication and just being heard by the community, especially elected officials in the community and the uh, residents they represent. Uh, wh what is the library's position as of today on this new library and what's going to happen with the existing facilities? Sure, um, council member, thanks for letting me bring this up again or clarify. So in uh, 2020, when we released our facilities master plan, we um, put forth a number of recommendations. But if you read the plan thoroughly, it says that these recommendations still need to be vetted, that these were basically ideas that needed to be vetted in order to determine um, whether there was going to be support for it, whether it was really, you know, it, whether this was the best idea for this particular location. So as of today, April 13th, we have not made any decisions regarding um, the future of the Shepherd Park Library, other than I would say that um, the existing library, and I might not use, um, you know, useful life, that might be a strong term, and, you know, apologies if that was me who used it in the past. I will say that the design, the interior design of that building is not, um, it, it doesn't match the standards that have um, developed over the past 12 years uh, or so with the, the modernization or new builds of 2023, 20, 24 libraries around. The Let me ask you a more specific question as relates to that. Um, is it the technology doesn't match the standards? Is the room size? Is it the projectors? What about the building is not watching, matching the standards? If you can speak to the interior design that you're referencing. 
Sure. I mean, there's um, quite a bit that we find lacking in that particular space. And, you know, I know that you asked about data um, earlier to a few people, and I've got data, and we can talk about what that means. But things like um, the fact that there aren't really separate spaces for kids, adults, and young adults. It's a sort of a, a single room. Uh, you know, that is not a best practice in libraries now. So, you know, we would really want to rethink about how we um, apportion space in that building. Um, the natural light is a is a huge issue in that space. So it's, you know, it's a relatively dark space. Um, and if you, go, you know, if you look at the, the, the libraries in your ward, we always prioritize natural light to give people that sense of uplift, that sense of joy. Um, other than that, you know, even our community rooms, they're sort of carved up, they're in Warrens, uh, one behind the other, they're not easily, so um, I believe you were at the opening for our Lamont Riggs Library. You'll notice that as soon as you walk into a building, you've got a large community room that could possibly stay open after the library is closed, things of that nature. So, you know, all these things sort of add up to suggest that, again, the, the standards of, of what we have accomplished over the past decade more is quite different than a building that was designed in the in the mid 1980s. I got that. I mean, those are some preferences. Um, more of is about the space for the matter for kids and adults. Um, but saying pastor is used to life normally refers to a building that is falling apart. And you have to keep investing money into it just to keep it uh operating and it's really a functional obsolescence where the the roof is just bad or the plumbing is just terrible or uh the hvac is just outdated those type of things some of these things you listed, yeah i would say functional, more than anything functional obsolescence is probably a, a fairer term um and, and what's going to happen with the current library um we don't know um, you know, at this point, uh, we are still gathering information. Um, uh, you know, we do have the engagement report that we published um, a couple of weeks ago or last week. Um, we're still looking to bring some numbers in around what it would cost to fully modernize the existing building. Uh, we're working with the Office of Planning on um, helping us figure out sort of walk sheds. What are the easiest ways to get to, you know, different spots in the area? So, you know, we're still evaluating information. We've not made any decisions about the future of the building um, thus far. Um, thank you. And when you do, we would like to know what those decisions are and the community engagement um, on, on that note. Um, yeah, I mean, this would go through my library board uh, council member, and you know that the library board meets religiously every two months. Yep. Um, but plus, yeah, we're not, we're not done um, uh, getting information and sharing information out. One thing we've heard um, um, across a few wards was about DC Public Library's community engagement and really listening and acting on the, the information provided from the community. Uh, what is, I guess, your standard operating procedure uh, or policy around community engagement? How does that happen? Can you walk me through that real quick? Sure. So typically for a, a, a new library project, assuming we know where it's going to be um, and the funding has been identified, and that's in the vast majority of our cases, we've rebuilt the library right on the spot of the old library. Um, our community engagement begins early. I think one of the public witnesses um, you know, mentioned correctly that you, um, you develop a program and then you build around that program. Our 20,000 square feet number is just a number that we've Kind of stuck to over the last decade that um, has worked for us by and large for for the most part. Um, I will say one thing that um, that caught my ear during the public testimony was uh, former former Commissioner Israel. Um, you know he talked about um, you know engagement early on in the process, and you know when I look at something like the Southeast Library modernization and the library's interim services approach, you know. We began that we began community engagement in that project um, as early as 2018. Frankly, I remember when I first moved to DC, uh, to DC I was engaging with um, the Friends President Neil Ge Neil Gregory in 2014 and 15. Um, community members had created an underground 
a library that was between the subway station and the existing library. So there was a lot of engagement throughout the course of the design process. That's where we do most of it. Now, I got a question so what, to that director real quick. Yeah. Um, so some of the engagement included conversations from former commissioners about a swing space at the Southeast Library. Um, is there going to be swing space? And if so, where? Um, we do not have plans for an interim library um, council member. Uh, and again, going back to at least 2018, I'm not going to sit here and say that it was absolutely unanimous, but we talked about it during community meetings and during smaller meetings with Council Member Allen, uh, members of the library board. We were moving forward with the assumption that because several years earlier, the Southeast Library served as a interim library for the Northeast Library, there really would be no reason that the other two, that it, we couldn't do it the other way around. Um, as it was mentioned before, um, frankly, you know, I've got Google Maps too. It's a 0.71 um, miles between the two libraries. And one thing that I think has not really been talked about, at least with uh, the the Southeast conversation, you know, we've got two, we've got great public transportation um, uh, around Capitol Hill. So there is like the 92 and the 90 bus, 90 bus that run up 8th Street Southeast, and they run with a lot of regularity. So if you can't make that 15 minute walk, you know, there's also a seven minute bus ride. With that said, you know, we do hear that we are trying to uh, provide some sort of pop-up services. Um, and uh, I th uh, uh, Commissioner Sobelson had mentioned uh, one thing that we were looking at, including a weekly story time program at Barracks Row Main Street. We're also doing some book clubs, uh, partnering with the Little District Books. And we're not, I'm not saying that we're done looking. You know, this notion of maybe can we work with the rec center on setting up some computers at Arthur Capper? I mean, I think that sounds reasonable. I'd like to talk to um, the interim director of DPR and see like, hey, can we get any traction there? But what I will say that with overwhelming unanimity throughout 2018, 2019, and then of course things went a little haywire during the pandemic, there was broad support for the library's approach regarding interim services. Also, we knew based on what we had to do to that building that the budget was going to be very tight. And you know, council so, member, that interim yeah. services comes out of the project budget. Yeah, so thank you, Director. So, I mean, we've heard this conversation in our last year, a little before that, um, about interim space since I've been the chair of this committee. Um, can you explain the rationale by not, by not planning or proposing anything in this budget for interim library or space that can address the residents' need during this break of service, I think, for two years? Um, well, Council Member, we are continuing to think of, you know, different things that we can do. But, you know, looking into the FY24 budget, if we were to request, for example, a trailer or um, a retail space, I mean, that would take a very long time. I can't tell you right here. I'll follow up with you. But to create an interim library the way we had, for example, the trailer at Southwest or the, um, the, um, the retail space for our West End library, um, you know, we knew that the project budget was going to be tight. And we thought that there was that that money should be invested into the overall project. And as you know, with the mayor's investment, we're already looking at a $30 million plus um, modernization of that Southeast library. And how much, I think you say you did link strategic partners. Is that accurate? Yes, for, um, for the recent um, uh, Shepherd Park engagement, yes. How much was that? Um, I don't have that number, but perhaps um, one of my team can provide that. Just so I can get that for me. I'll tread along. Um, um, funding for your personnel division increased by almost 90,000 and a part-time employee. Can you specify what those funds will be used for, Director? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a little bit of, and in a lot of these, uh, small shifts in the library's budget council member, you'll see some increases for um, like step increases, colas, that sort of thing. 
and then maybe a larger decrease in the NPS budget. So that um, occurs throughout the, basically throughout the budget. It won't have a, um, uh, an impact that's you know, highly visible, but um, you know, at the same time, it might take a little bit longer if we don't have a filled vacancy or something like that to, to fill positions and that sort of thing. Uh, I see that you, um, we talked about communicating with the public and just um, people feel like they're being heard. I see your communications budget grew about two FTEs. Um, what capacity would these FTEs serve in a way that over communication and empathize and hears from the residents and communicating the message and receiving information at all? Um, so the two FTEs that are in the budget now is a basically two FTEs that were temporarily reassigned to the marketing and communications budget, but that's not a um, that's not a permanent shift. They were put in to assist with different uh, different projects. So are these temporary positions? What you're saying? No, they're full time positions. But you know, within the libraries, within other agency, you borrow FTE to do different things. And so these were two borrowed positions. Okay. Okay. Oh, and I've got the uh, number for you um, for the engagement it was 24,000. Okay, thank you, Director. Um, Language access um, budget item has decreased by, uh, um, I guess, from 14K to, to 12K. Um, and we know that uh, we have a lot of uh, residents who speak a variety of languages. I think that um, uh, Ms. Renee Bowles has talked about the, the Ethiopians and the region residents speaking Amharic or, or, or this growing uh, Spanish speaking um, Latino residents uh, in, in the community. How do we uh, still uh, address those needs for those English and otherwise speaking language barriers that we see growing in the communities? Um, yeah, there's no degradation of service with that loss of $2,000, um, council member. We, um, we have just um, acquired a new website add-on called Weglot, and that's a, a basically it's a translation service for the DC Public Library website. Um, it helps us actually save a little bit of money, and um, it, it doesn't result in any in any loss of language access services. Um, you know, DC Public Library prides itself in being you know providing timely language access services around the community for reasons that you just mentioned, as well as uh, former Commissioner Bowser as well. Now, what is the distance between the uh, Southeast Library and the Northeast Library? Point, point 0.71 miles. Point 0.71. Oh, and I should, you know what? I um, the I apologize, the uh, two FTE in, in marketing communications were temporary. Okay. Sorry. And you said 0. 0.71 miles between the two libraries. Um, that's, yeah, that's, you know, I'm not a cartographer, but when I do the map, that's that's what I get. Um, I heard I heard um, some very amazing things happen at the library as it relates to programming. Uh, mm -hmm. In this budget, how do you foresee keeping um, good programming going and creating new programming as time permits? I'm over my time. You can answer that quickly. I got to go to come up. It becomes harder. I mean, there's there's no way around it. Um, you know, we've got some strategies that work. Uh, you know, we work with a lot of partners to do a lot of, pro like the MLK Library has become a destination for the entire city and region. Um, Council Member Lewis George mentioned that she was here for the We Believe in Freedom exhibition. That was something that the library didn't pay for. That was something that we did, that we built in partnership with the National Women's History Museum. So we've got, um, we've got techniques to bring in partner institutions uh, where they can leverage our space and we leverage their content and we inform their content. Uh, but in terms of just, you know, your average program here at MLK or across the branches, you know, it's it's uh, quite likely that we will have to be doing um, just a little bit less of that because we're going to be doing a little bit of less of everything. 
Got it. Council member Janice Lewis George, first round if you um ready. And I know she's in and out of other hearings. Okay, so I'll try to come back to her. If my staff can ping her staff to see if she's coming back or not, that'd be helpful to me. Um Hey, I'm, I'm finishing up one thing in another here and give me two minutes and I will be right back. All right. I'll go to some few Thank questions. You. You Thank you back. so much. All right. So we noted that the collections funds will increase by roughly 73,000 FY24. How would this increase, increase be allocated um, in a way that that speaks to like your your uh, you say it would be rough not having the program dollars. Like, how would you use this money to um, create some to cover some of the holes? Um, that's actually not money for books themselves. That is a salary adjustment for a new hire. Um, so, uh, so that's that's not going to be a a cut to the to the collections budget itself. No, the funding increase, increase, I'm sorry, the funding increase by seven. Right, the funding increase is for basically salary adjustments. Okay. I think for a new so hire. Two categories for salary adjustments because we just talked about one uh, category for salary adjustments before. Um, just a few moments ago, that was a different category of funding. Correct. That was a different um, department. Can you talk a little bit about your children and young adult services? And, you know, I see there was a, a little bit increased. What is this and how would those funds be used to provide services? Um, as with everything else, council member, we would see um, some reduced number of programs um, across the campus by virtue of losing any amount of staff or any amount of um, NPS dollars, you know, I am super proud of the children's services that we do both at the branch as well as coordinated through our um, Office of Youth and Family Engagement. Um, I don't know if you've gone past, for example, um, you know, some of like the, the, the Francis Gregory Library, we've got these great um, marketing vinyl things up on the window promoting our great uh, Beyond the Book program that uh, gets more resources to kids between the ages of five and eight. So, I mean, we're doing great things. That's actually done. That that program itself is is privately funded, but in terms of a loss of um, any loss of dollars in FY24, will will result in somewhat fewer services. I mean, we're not talking here in any one of these categories about hundreds of thousands of dollars, but we are talking about you know some some decrease. Okay. Um, I, when you're talking about decreases, I did note that you are losing some federal grant funds and about 11,000, I think I saw. Uh, is, is that accurate, Director? 11,000 in grant, oh, um, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep up, uh, Council Member, uh, just yeah. not going, um, but I believe that that's the LSTA um, the Library Services and Technology Act funding. Uh, we basically, the, the, the original number was an estimate because we didn't have the full number when the budget was developed. So it's not really a loss in, it's not, it's not a loss other because the, the, the number, the funding number is, is, is actually different than what was originally submitted. Got it, okay. I haven't seen Councilman Janice Lewis George return yet, so I'll keep at it. Oh, there she is. I'm back. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman White. Thank you so much. You already know we were all hopping around on hearings, uh, but we're going to make it through this budget season. Um, great. Um, Director, um, I want to start uh, with a question. Um, I've been in the Juanita Thornton Library several times in the past few weeks, including last night. Um, and I have to say, to my eye, the facility can, can support the needs of the community. 
Um, but when you say the building is functionally obsolete uh, because it has, I guess, one big space or et cetera, define what do you mean about uh, functionally obsolete? Um, I'm not sort of hearing a statement that is based on the needs articulated by, by this library's users. Um, when we began rebuilding the library system uh, council member in about 2010, uh, we created libraries that focus on um, you know, inspiring spaces with a lot of natural light. Um, within those spaces, we have you know, separate spaces for people to meet in groups or meet in, in small numbers. Uh, the spaces are um, logically adjacent to one another. Um, there's separate discrete spaces for kids, adults, young adults. Uh, you know, these are the types of things that we consider when we're thinking about libraries in the, you know, I guess, second quarter of the 21st century. Okay. Um, I mean, it has a lot of natural light coming in. I just want to... if. I we were just there last night hmm. okay. um and it has a it's it does have a not a, a lot of natural light to it um I guess my question is less to sort of is what's the use of life uh on the building um you know I'm I don't think that use of life is the best indicator here as much as the building needs to be modernized if if the building is is to stay um but um i understand that but do you, you can reno a, you can you renovate a, a, you can renovate a building forever right i mean we've we've seen that so oh, i agree i just want to know do you know what the use of life is on the building um no there wouldn't be a number for for um the use of life useful life you i thought i thought every building ha has a useful life you know, I would maybe That's talk true. to an architect or something, but like to, you know, some people's points, we'd have buildings that are 50 years old, buildings that are older than that. You know, you can, Shepherd Park Library in 2016, we did an emergency roof roof replacement. So, you know, those sorts of things can be done. Okay. Um, and when you say sort of the functionality is obsolete, my understanding is with with renovations and modernizations, it, we would be able to make it work functionally with modernizations and renovations. Is that I mean, correct? You know, it depends on the budget, but you know, potentially. Um, I would. I'm not a designer, but I work very closely with architects to sort of reimagine what buildings could look like. Um, but you know, a lot of this is subjective, Council Member. In 2018. We proposed a modernization of a library in um, in Capitol View, and we were sued for that because they felt that they were being deprived of um, you know some of the newer architecture that had been built across the uh, across the city. But you know, clearly, there's you know you can think about doing new things through a modernization, of course. Um, can you give me a sort of, I just want to see a comparison here. Can you compare sort of the condition of Shepherd Park Library to, to the Petworth Library? Uh, is, is in your mind the Shepherd Park Library in much worse condition than Petworth? And because I know we're renovating the Petworth Library rather than tearing it down. Uh, so I, I, I'm interested in that response so I can see why we're treating the, the libraries differently. The Petworth Library underwent a major modernization within the historic structure um, in 2012. Um, yeah, and of course, with historic buildings, that adds some complexity to what you can do and what can't be done. But, um, but the systems at the Petworth Library are newer. And what we're doing um, this year, thanks for your advocacy, is more of a you know, as it's about a $1.5 million job that's going to help, for example, I think better identify space for, for teens, but it's, you know, it's, it's a modest, it's a, it's what we, we would call a refresh. Okay. Um, so Petworth went through a sort of a modern is a, a full sort of modernization. How will you compare that to Tacoma? You consider that a refresh or a modernization? Um, well, Tacoma went through a full, eh, Tacoma is an interesting one. Um, Tacoma went through, prior to my arrival here in 2009, I wanna say it was maybe about a $5 million um, 
or so, but I can get you those numbers if um, if you want them, council member. Um, and again, you know, the historic buildings like Tacoma, Mount Pleasant, um, Southeast, Petworth, they're different than um, buildings like Chevy Chase or um, or Shepherd Park or the old Cleveland Park or their old Southwest, which were Wait. more so recent. Okay, so Petworth and Tacoma are both in your mind, both Petworth and Tacoma are historical buildings. So you all could not, you you had the limitation, you couldn't just tear it down and rebuild it. You had to modernize and renovate with within the within the the, the space that you had. Within the footprint, you know, Tacoma within Park is still, is still only 8,000 square feet. Um, That's right. Which, and which is not ideal. So I guess because Tacoma and and Petworth both were not projects where you had to literally tear down a building and start from scratch. You had to work with the space that you had, I guess, then that means that for, with Shepherd Park, Juanita Thornton Library, you could do the same. We could modernize anything. Or, 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 or at least, you know, create some drawings and designs. I mean, you know, people didn't think that the Martin Luther King Jr. Library was, right. was salvageable. That's right. Yeah, that so, is true. People did not think Martin Luther King was salvageable, and you all and everyone proved them differently. And it is a beautiful, functional space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and again, the sometimes the bones of a library are helpful in terms of modernization versus rebuild. And you know, we're not there with um, with Shepherd Park. So um, you know, some of our buildings have basically better. It's easier to sort of gut um, than than others. But uh, but your point for sure. Yeah. And so um, why? Well, well, then can I say this? Can DCPL commit to then modernizing and renovating Shepherd Park, Juanita Thornton Library, as is in its current location? Is it possible? Yes. The if it's possible, then that means then, then if, if it is possible, then that means it's really on you all as far as a will and a choice. Well, the direction that I've gotten since I've been here, um, council member, is that the modern is the, the the renaissance of the DC public library system was going to involve the replacement or full modernization of every single building. And to to this point, we have been working on the assumption that we were going to, even if it would be rebuilding on site, we would be rebuilding that library. Um, so that's something that I can't answer yes or no to you right here. Again, I've got a board and, you know, it's, it's, this is something that is one of the, uh, certainly one of the options, but, you know, I can't commit one way or the other. What, um, help me under, help me unpack. We why. also don't have a budget for that yet. What, All right, what? we're going to do the work in the budget, and I and and it's it's here with it's here with the council, so it, it's up to us to do the work in the budget, and I and I fully take on that responsibility with my colleagues to make that yeah, happen. Yeah. One but of the I, things. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, just quickly. One of the things that we're committing to doing as part of this, um, some uh, some of the uh, initial research that include the engagement report, um, is the um, you know sort of true cost of what modernizing that building is um, based on, you know, FY 27, 26, 28 costs, wh whatever that will be. So we will be sharing those those costs and we can kick the tires on those together if you like. Okay. What is what is the um what is what is the decision behind choosing deciding that this needs to be sort of we need to tear down this building. I just want to hear sort of what the decision is and and um because I know there will there like there we could be an environmental there could be an environmental assessment or anything of that regard to sort of any environmental damage of tearing down a functional space when it can be modernized. But I'm just asking you what the what the reasoning behind you all saying it has to be a complete uh, break destruction and then build up. Um, it doesn't have to, um, council member, and even in the. Um, even in our next Libras report, we say that, you know, there are other options to those recommendations that we put in the report, um, including everything from Band-Aids, which is like, let's swap out the HVAC system, um, which I don't think is a good service to the community, to, you know, full modernization. So, you know, th these are things that we can still look at. 
Okay. So then I don't even know where, I don't know why that was even considered if we don't have a basis for, for considering it. Um, Would you like another round? Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I will like another round. I wasn't even looking at the clock. My bad. (laughs) Okay. Yes. Thank you. I'll jump back to you in a moment then. If that's okay you. I'll try to be brief. I have a few more. Um, Director, um, the MLK Library was tooted today for phenomenal programming, but I'm concerned um, because the library staff was reduced by 6.5 FTEs. How would this shift affect uh, the library's uh, effectiveness? Um, you know, at this point, if I look at the um, 19 or so FTE, uh, a few of them provide direct public services. And as I mentioned earlier, council member, that would mean some degradation of service, but it would be hard for me to quantify exactly um, what that would mean. Um, we tried to, you know, in terms of the vacant FTEs that are being swept, we tried to, um, they all hurt, you know, we don't hire people who sit around, but we, we, we try to prioritize those positions that are not um, that are not giving uh, direct public services um, to to the community. Um, and now that I've found actually the, the question here, and I apologize that I don't have all these small shifts um, committed uh, to memory, that's actually um, that 6.5 FTE reduction is actually just moving five and a half of those FTEs to um, address agency needs in neighborhood libraries. And it does result in the elimination of one vacant FTE. Okay. Um, um, so I see that funding and also was reduced for literacy resources from 1.7 to 1.69 a difference in roughly 82,000. Can you speak to that real quick, Director? Yeah, so as I mentioned that there were across the board cuts um, and what we would anticipate happening in the Literacy Resource Center uh, would probably be some fewer Microsoft Office Suite programs, uh, maybe uh, some of the uh, reduction um, of the, you know, some of our certification programs like Grow with Google, uh, maybe a few, less conversation circle classes as those classes are typically led by the contractual services that we use that that we use this funding for got it um so funding for neighborhood libraries was reduced by almost a million dollars 863,000 um resulting in 8.5 fewer FTEs uh, how do we as try to keep Again, the capacity of trying to say we want to get more um, people, more people coming into libraries, using libraries with less staff, and then we say we're shifting of some from downtown to the community. I'm, I'm not sure how. To, can you give us some insight on this, Derek? Sure. Um, let me just get to that question. Sorry, Council Member, if you bear with me, they're just jumping around here. Um, so there's a net decrease of 863,000 from the Neighborhood Library Services budget uh, reflects a decrease in the NPS budget. So um, the reduction of 8.5 FTEs includes a movement of one FTE from the Neighborhood Library Services to the Children and Youth Services budget um, and the elimination of 7.5 vacant FTE. So again, it's not going to affect our ability to maintain ours but it will affect, you know, basically staff coverage in the neighborhood and central libraries. It could mean, you know, oh, we want to we want to provide, you know, an additional program, but that program can't go on because the person is needed to cover a desk, um, that sort of thing. It's not, you know, it's not the sort of thing that makes headlines, but it's, um, as I said in my testimony and have repeated a couple of times, it's just sort of a kind of the small degradation of service. Gotcha. There was one program that I was noting. Yeah, it was a good program. I think it was like your the children program where we have children reading. Um, let me try to find what that program was. That program was like a hallmark program that we noted in previous hearings. Um, 
I don't think that we are touching any of our um, our sort of signature kids programs. Um, we have one question from the committee about a nine thousand dollar increase in children and youth and young adult services, um, and and this is basically a, a, a increase to cover some overtime costs for Sundays, which is uh, you know we're open on Sundays and um, and the personnel increase allows us to provide some outreach to public events that occur on Sundays. Got it. I'll, I'll find it somewhere. Um, uh, I see it could custodial and maintenance funding was reduced by roughly uh, 387,000. Um, and and two FTEs, how would this impact on maintenance and keeping these buildings up? We talk about a building that's beyond its use for life, and then we, you know, we're at the same time trying to compensate for the budget and, and it's affecting maintenance. Um, yeah, I mean, um, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, it's it's not ideal, right? Um, uh, custodial maintenance budget covers everything from how often we clean our buildings to how well we maintain the landscaping outside of our buildings, um, how often we have to do things like, you know, pest abatement, that sort of thing. So it's, um, you know, it, it's not great. It doesn't mean that we're not gonna clean our buildings, but maybe we'll go in some instances from, you know, three cleanings a day to two cleanings or, or something like that. Um, it's- uh, Yeah, and I think the program I was talking about was reading time for toddlers. It was a very popular program. Would this be affected at all? No, not in any demonstrable way, um, uh, council member. Again, you know, certainly the possibility of one staff member being pulled to cover, to keep a building open, uh, maybe, you know, increasing the likelihood of the cancellation of a story time program or something like that. But, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, we want to prioritize our public services as much as possible. But you know, after a while, it's hard to just—it's hard to hide um, the loss of any type of loss, right? Two point three percent is not um, is not nothing. So, director, how do you respond to the need for a library in the Navy Yard area? Um, it's grown it's grown to over eight thousand residents. Um, the commissioner uh, spoke to trying to partner with DC Parks and Rec, so maybe use some space inside of Arthur Capers Rec. Um, what's your response to that? You know, um, the Capital Recreation Facility down um, south of the Southeast Library, south of the highway, we can certainly look into um, what it would look like to provide maybe some technology. I mean, I've, you know, it's not our space, but we we will talk to uh, DPR about is there anything that we can put in there um, to uh, to maybe give you know people access to maybe a couple of additional computers. You know, I don't know what's in there right now. I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, as far as I know, well, I, I don't know anything. I don't know if they've got computers. I don't know if they need more computers. Um, but you know, that's something that that we can look into. And I what think about that, books? I'm sorry. What about, book, what about books and other reading materials? Um, you know, we can look. We've actually been looking into vending machines. Um, there are some logistical issues around that, and there are budget issues around vending machines because they have to communicate with the library's um, integrated library system. So we just can't. It's you know, like you and I over the years, council member, have talked about little free libraries. Right, where yeah, you can just yeah. put some, some books in a corner. That's one thing, but having uh, you know books on a shelf at a rec center, that more or less has to be treated like a branch, and it's not as easy as it may sound, based on the fact that it does have to uh, communicate with the library's um, base, its catalog system, its its ILS. Okay, and would it take a lot to uh, to, to set that up? Uh, yeah, potentially. Yeah, we can follow back up with your office, but um, potentially, uh, you know, we would need, first of all, a willing partner. Um, there could be need for, you know, data, for power. Um, there's 
ongoing maintenance needs for these machines. And, you know, I'm, I'm concerned with the cuts that are being proposed right now, you know, in addition to our inability to do things beyond what we are already committing to or losing. Does that make, do, do yeah, I even heard, um, yes, it makes sense to me, just kind of somebody to kind of operate it, to keep it going and figure out how to access it. Um, and then I'm, I'm assuming these machines are not very large machines or you have a very large variety. I don't know, I've never seen them. Um, no, I mean, you know, think of like candy bar machine, you know? Yeah. Um, but I do think that we need to do something down there to my 8,000. It's probably more than that because we just did the census. The census. I, mean, I, I think, you know, the, the existential question that you raise, um, council member, you know, Navy Yard is growing and we've had, uh, you you recall at the, at the oversight hearing, um, there was, in addition to Brightwood Park and Manor Park, there's, you know, Ivy City, right? There was um, U Street, Adams Morgan. I mean, there are a lot of residents who are, interested in library services. The other thing I said at the oversight hearing is that, you know, visits to our libraries are actually, except for MLK and a few others, visits are pretty way down. And one of the things that- Can I stop you for the second, Director? Because yep. I need to get an uh, answer for the Navy Yard community as relates to a library and access to library space, books, and activities there. Is there a plan to address the need for libraries that we heard? No, uh, not at the moment, no. Not at the moment. Okay. No. I mean, so we want to we want to open that conversation up and figure that out because we are in the budget season and we don't put any money or thought, idea, or concepts behind it, and it dies off. And we have uh, uh, commissioners who are advocating for that as well. Um, yeah, I get it. And uh, just a reminder, we're talking about that in the context of you know almost two million dollars of of proposed cuts across the core library functions. But I for sure, give an answer to Commissioner Nick when I speak back with him and other commissioners. So, if you guys can look into that, that'd be helpful because we can't just acknowledge the problems and have and say we don't have a solution. Just leave it at that, especially with and, over a thousand residents. Right, and just as as a reminder, that came up as an idea to address Southeast Library interim services, possibly looking at Arthur Capper as a space, and again. Um, that's not something that we had considered, but we can look at what it might take, as I mentioned, to do some minimal interventions there. All right, Council Member Janice Lewis-George, would you like a second round? Yes, uh, Council Member White, if I can. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, Director, has, has DCPL ever moved forward to acquire property for a new library, library site? And if so, how did that process work? Um, I don't believe we've actually ever done any site acquisition ourselves. I could be wrong. And one... Who did it for you? Who did it then? You know, um, this would predate me, and I don't actually believe we're allowed to acquire. That would be district government would be acquiring it. The library doesn't own its own property, so district government would be responsible for acquiring the site that the library would operate. And how have you all gone, and I understand that part, all of our, all I'm the chair of facilities over DGS, so all of our property sort of cover in that right. regard. I, um, I'm just asking you if you've ever in selecting a site for a library, has has have you all with in combination with DGS acquired a property that you knew you were going to utilize for a library? And if so, what was that process? Um, you know, we we haven't really done that right now. Um, and I don't know if this answers your question, but you know, we're looking to partner with Demphead and Wamada on building a library at the Congress Heights. Mm -hmm. um, so but that might be the only example that I can possibly give you if I'm not sure if that answers your question, but but we the library itself does not does not acquire. We would we would look to partner with with Demped basically on acquisition. Okay, so Demped would have to choose the at choose the location and acquire it for for DCPL to utilize it. 
Right. Within, you know, we we are very involved in the location. I mean, they can't just be like, hey, here's a spot for you. Go build a library. In fact, you know, that's one of the reasons that we've taken a more sort of intentional approach to facilities and our facilities master plan. It can't be just anywhere. Right. So what does that process look like? Um, you know, in the case of um, Congress Heights, we did a sort of a study of the land um, and we recommended that we work with DEMPED to identify a site within half a mile of the existing um, Parklands Turner branch. And, you know, we had a few other things that we wanted to check off, but um, we discovered that the um, St. Elizabeth's campus had space that they were willing to work with us on. Okay. I'm going to come back to that. Are you all involved in finding a location to service to serve the library service gap in Brightwood Park and Manor Park? No. Okay. And if, but you would have to be involved if, if, if Dempe were choosing a space for it, then you would have to say, this is, this fits, this can fit the needs for the library. I mean, I, ideally, right. I mean, I would hate to and just so, put in the library. Yeah. So how did you all give a presentation at Walter Reed regarding a potential space for a library if you all aren't involved in the acquisition of space for a library or the building of space for a library? We have toured Walter Reed. Um, you know, we've seen some spaces at Walter Reed. I've been very clear. About I, that's what I'm saying. So that, that's why I'm confused. So either you are a part of the process or you aren't a part of the process. So how did Walter Reed happen if you're if you're saying that you all aren't a part of processes of acquiring spaces or news? I'm sorry, I did say that we are a stakeholder, but we do not acquire space. You know, the acquisition of space has a certain financial um connotation that we do not we do not do. But okay. In, so how did you all become involved with Walter Reed to the to the fact that you were at the Walter Reed CAC presenting about a potential library at Walter Reed? Because, yeah, and that that that's my question. Um, Council member, you know, conversations between the library and Walter Reed have been have gone back as far back as I've been here with some interest in the library possibly relocating uh, to Walter Reed. So as part of our due diligence. We have gone out um, to Walter Reed. Um, you know that's okay. really. So you are. So you all are involved in that in the acquisition process. You're involved. You are involved in the selection acquisition, acquisition process. Not the that's, acquisition, but the selection for sure. Okay. Saying that, like this space works for us. This space doesn't work for us. Yes. Hypothetically, this space I could mean, work. I for us. Let me ask you this, as, as we heard, you all commissioned a, a consultant to conduct a survey, focus group and interviews to evaluate the community's interest in closing the Juanita Thornton Shepherd Park Library on Georgia Avenue and building a new library on the Walter Reed campus. Um, yet this survey confirmed for many that DCPL is solely looking at putting the new library at Walter Reed by including that as the only option for a new location and failing to conduct an equitable outreach across neighborhoods. I will be blunt, I do not believe this community engagement process genuinely sought the community's input about what people want and need from the branch library. And I have questions about the community engagement around a potential relocation of the Walter Reed Library. Um, the capital budget funding for the new War for Library says that the new library is supposed to serve our Shepherd Park, Brightwood Park, and Manor Park communities. And I'm assuming a Walter Reed community too is, is in that. Um, so I heard your statement regarding your a disagreement about that characterization. Characterization. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Why did DCPL conduct stakeholder interviews with nine Shepherd Elementary parents, but zero parents from Truesdale Ele Elementary in, in Brightwood Park? Um, I'll have to get back to you, um, Council Member. I don't know the answer to that specific question. Okay. Why did DCPL conduct stakeholder interviews with ANC commissioners from 4A, 4B, and 4E, but failed to conduct interviews with any 4D commissioners, given that 4D encompasses all of Brightwood Park? You know, based on what we've heard, including from you, relocating the library to Brightwood Park is not going to serve the Shepherd Park community. I think that that's something that has been pretty that's well correct. established. Right. 
So our stakeholder engagement was really about the appetite for moving that, moving the existing building several blocks to the south so that it would be completely clear that it is still the Shepherd Park Library. Um, you know, could it serve additional users to the south by virtue of the popularity of Walter Reed? Quite possibly. But the, the, uh, the goal of this particular engagement was not to determine, um, you know, Manor Park, Brightwood Park, or, or anything else. You know, we, we've compartmentalized this uh, that, well, that's what the language, that's what the language of the capital improvement plan is saying. The language in the capital improvement plan says that, and I know that that has not that been is, changed. Correct. So if this, so based on that language, if this library is supposed to serve all three neighborhoods, Shepherd Park, Manor Park, and Bright, Brightwood Park, my question is, why did the vast majority of responses, 65% come from 20012 zip code that includes Shepherd Park, but only 27% of the responses came from residents and 20011, the zip code that includes both Manor Park and Brightwood Park. Okay. Um, maybe we need to update the language in the in the CIP or see how that's done. But our goal here was really to start at the nucleus, which is the Shepherd Park Library and the surrounding community. And that was the focus of this very targeted engagement. Yesterday, we heard uh, yesterday and, and from several witnesses, we heard that they felt that the library survey uh, was not neutral and not database scientific based or, or, or fair and accurate of how Shepherd Park communities fail. Uh, did you think that the survey question asked questions neutrally or were the questions leading people to include that it would be better to re relocate the library at Walter Reed? Um, I certainly did not think that they were leading questions. Um, is the survey scientific? Probably not. Um, at the same time, I think it can offer valuable information as well as the conversations that had ta taken place. I think it's clear that it is not a slam dunk one way or the other. Um, but I did not think it was leading. I certainly did not. Okay. There were several questions that community members noted felt that they were that were leading one survey question to respondents. If you don't currently visit the Shepherd Park, please indicate uh, a, a reason why. And then a clear majority, 58 percent skipped this question. Um, but the this, this survey never sort of asked people why why people do visit this library. Um, they noted questions asked about uh things you would like to do at the library that you currently can't. Um, and even more people skip that question at 63%. Um, did the survey ask what people like would like to do at the Juanita Thornton Library? Um, and for, for you, people were very upset because it did not even ask what users like to do at the current Juanita Thornton Library. Um, Council member, I, I apologize. I don't have the survey with me. Uh, I'm happy very happy to meet with you and go through the survey and we can poke holes in it um, um, and you know, do our best to address it. And I'm not saying it was perfect, um, but I, I don't have it with me and I, I can't speak to um, you know, why certain questions were phrased in such a way um, or, or not. You know, I think that we had a good faith effort here to try and get um, uh, community input around that proposed project. Um, and, uh, you know, if if our effort doesn't, you know, didn't meet the demands, then, you know, I'm, I'm apologize for that. It came under the library's imprimatur. So that's my, my responsibility. But, you know, again, I do think that we were just looking to capture um, a, a very pinpointed uh, sort of get an idea about a, a specific opportunity. Okay. Um, I understand that. And I think because of your act, because of those actions, the Brightwood Park, Shepherd Park, and, and, and Council Member uh, Trayon White, if I could just have leave for a few, uh, like three more questions, I would appreciate it. Sure, go right ahead. Thank you so, thank you so much. Um, uh, that the community felt like they were not in many of the, both all three communities in FLA were engaged, but then uh, I guess there's some confusion as to where and how Walter Reed even came about. And as a result, um, members of our community have been asking for a new library at uh, on Kennedy Street, 
for mm-hmm. Brightwood Park and Manor Park. And there seems to there seems to have been sort of a, I guess you can explain why, the effort to go to Walter Reed to find a space for a new library. And so I guess the question is, um, will you give that same effort to uh, acquiring a new library space on Kennedy Street? Um, the reason that we spent time thinking about Walter Reed was because we understand that we cannot relocate that Shepherd Park Library too far south at this point. Um, are we interested in hearing about what folks on Kennedy Street want? Absolutely. But again, you know, this is we have a, a facilities master plan where we said that we were going to address our operating issues. And we're operating um, based on the fact that we believe there is an operating issue at the existing Shepherd Park Library. So we've got tons of projects that um, are part of that facilities plan. And you know the library CIP, I'm sure. That's you know, right. I have it. That's right. So how much, have, let me ask you this, how much would DCPL expect to pay for the space at Walter Reed campus? I have no idea. I mean, we haven't had that. We we were not at those, at that level of, of um, and for that, we would need money for site acquisition, right? Much early than we could budget for and design a construction of a new library. No, I don't believe that there would be site acquisition um, fees necessary for that. For that, why not? Because um, I think that it's being built, you know, as part of a mixed use, and I think that, as was the case with uh, like the West End Library, you know, we didn't pay site acquisition fees there. Um, and, uh, you know, rather than me sort of like blather on, I would rather if an opportunity were to arise, you know, there would be a term sheet. And I think it would be something that you could point to and say why or why not. But hypothetically, I'm, I'm afraid, council member, that, you know, real estate development is not my expertise. But, um, you know, we're happy to follow up with you if and when that opportunity arises. The proposed capital budget plan includes $25 million for a new 4A library right now. That's what it says, to replace Juanita E. Thornton. Um, I, I, you do understand that the goal. my goal is to change that replace language. So let me ask you this. How much would it cost to modernize uh, and renovate the current Juanita Thornton she- Shepherd Park Library? Um, we don't have that number yet, um, council member, but uh, we will have that. Um, shortly. Um, so we can share that with you. Um, I'll just give you a couple of just for. And I don't instance. want it to be based on me. I want it to be based on you. Before you do that, you have to have a meeting with, I think, 4A commissioners has asked you to have, have a meeting with them. And I think they're, they said they would partner with the Shepherd Park uh, uh, um, Citizens Association because they want whatever the plans are for Juanita Thornton Library as is to meet the needs of the community and services. And I think what everybody just wants this decision to be based on is not sort of anyone else anyone else's goals of development, but on the need and the usefulness for the community of Shepherd Park. Yeah, I mean, you know, council member, we're not looking to do anything um, for any other reason than trying to serve more members of uh, of the community. That's the goal of the facilities plan. Um, that's what I've been charged to do by the library board of trustees. Um, so, you know, that that is our goal. How do we serve more people? Um, you know, within I mean, I think a reasonable budget. I, I understand the board of trustees, but the only proposed funding source is the capital budget, which is supported right. by district taxpayers. The DCBL yeah. trustees are a very oh, yeah. sophisticated governing board, but they aren't in a position to provide the funding here. Um, um correct. I want to I want to ask about um so I want to get your final position on this. Will will you all do you agree that DCPO will work to find a solution to keep the Juanita Thornton Library where it is to modernize and renovate it and to find a, a, if a space is presented to you all, similar to how I guess Walter E was presented to you by God, no one knows at this point the answer to who, um, that, that you would be able to work to acquire a new space to rent, uh, for Kennedy Street Library? Um. Council member, my commitment to you and to everyone else is that we are going to put forth a recommendation at some point in the near future. Um, and 
you know, whether you agree or disagree with that recommendation, you know, we will back it up with as much information as we can. Um, hopefully we'll be aligned. Well, I, what I want, I don't, uh, and thank you. I appreciate that you all will give us a recommendation. Here's the thing, because you all have come out with recommendations and it's based on this survey right now with the SKU survey. Right, let me ask you, can the recommendation be based once you have a meeting? Let me ask you this. Will you have a meeting with the 4A community, the 4B community and the 4D community, like an actual meeting? led by their led by their commissioners to come up with what you propose instead of having a fixed proposal that fits whoever's uh, whoever's needs cuz I, I think you understand why users library users are perceived this as a done deal because of the lack of true engagement that has been requested so i don't want to see a proposal or recommendation to us without a, a, an engagement an engagement by with the community by us that would actually feed that recommendation. And yeah, you know, I'm sorry, uh, council member, can you remind me what those neighborhoods are that are being served here? Uh, those, those. For, um... Yes, so 4A, which represents our Shepherd Park yeah. community and will yeah. ultimately represent our uh, Walter Reed community. 4B and and 4A actually also is Brightwood too. So you have Brightwood and Shepherd Park and Walter Reed under 4A. 4B is our Manor Park and South Manor Park community, which includes the lower half of uh, lower half of Kennedy Street and uh, parts of Kennedy Street. Um, and then you have Brightwood Park, which has the other side of the other side of Kennedy Street, uh, is our, and that is our 4D community. So 4D would be Brightwood Park for 4B would be Manor Park, South Manor Park, and 4A would be Shepherd Park, Brightwood, um, and the new Walter Reed campus. And I don't think any recommendations should be given from you all without a meeting with the ANC, ANC commissioners, led by the ANC commissioners for the community to weigh in on what a useful library would be for their community and their needs. And so I just want to get a commitment that those, those three meetings of, of engagement will happen before a recommendation is put out. And then I would like to and know what the timeline would be on a recommendation coming out. Um, council member, the, the problem here is that our recommendation does not involve at this point serving the Brightwood Park community with this operational issue that we've got at the the BSA subtitle literally says I, I that. So I, I believe it. you if it didn't. <laughs> I, I get it. No, I, I get it. But I've also heard you many times say that it is impossible to serve both communities with one facility. Right now- That's my right. We, it's a two, a two facility. A, right. That's right. It's impossible to serve both communities. Exactly. We agree. It's impossible to serve both communities with a, so, one, with a one library option. And Walter Reed being that option doesn't serve any of those communities. So given that, I want to make sure that we are proposing what is best future of our existing asset, the Shepherd Park Library, before making promises to, as you've heard at this hearing, you know, there are 10 neighborhoods who've come to this commit to, you know, who who would be envious of having or would like some library space. I would be putting myself and the agency in a position where we're making promises that we can't keep. We have got a facilities plan that we spend a lot of time working on. We want to fulfill that plan. And if that, at some point, that will involve getting more information about the future of the rest of the city. Um, as I've mentioned many times already, I think this is a- well, Where did it be? Where did, the, where did the, the, the subtitle language come? I'm telling you that right now, the, the subtitle language literally says a library to serve Brightwood Park Manor Park, Shepherd Park community. So you all already put that, it in, that's already in the language right now. And so now you're saying, oh, let's step back from that language. Is that what you're saying now? Correct, yeah. The language that you're referring to was in the, in the library's original facilities master plan. And those recommendations- and that's within our current budget right now. And those recommendations said that, that those, that was not a firm decision 
but rather it's in, it's in the fiscal year 24 budget that we got we're you know it that we're looking at right now and so and it was changed from fiscal year 23 to 24 so clearly thought went into it because it changed the language changed from 23 to 24 so mm -hmm. if you're saying you're walking mm -hmm. back that language i'm just telling you that's what we have in front of us that was sent down from the mayor that now we as the council have to deal with so i, I that doesn't make sense um, I'm not aware of the changes to the narrative of the uh, CIP council member, but again, back to the point that I raised a second ago, you know, before expanding this to communities that um, without any ability for me to, to figure out how to address um, the needs or wishes of residents from across the city, our primary focus is the fulfillment of that facilities plan. And to your point, we have reduced, you know, the scope. If that's the case, then the Walter, Walter Reed meeting should have never happened. And you all shouldn't have presented a plan at Walter Reed if that was, if that's the true intention. But director, well, all I'm asking is for you personally to meet with 4A commissioners and community, 4B commissioners and community, and 4D commissioners and community. That in my mind is a simple, that's a simple request. Will you meet with them or will you not? I have to do, we do meet, me, me and Trey, I got to do meetings every day with stakeholders and community members. So, yeah, and people, right. have, you meet, right, literally, can you meet with uh, our, us? And we have to say, yes, we'll meet with this community. So I'm asking, will you can I add the meet with them? Can I add the youth of Emory uh, Heights right. Community Center? Because they were here saying they not engaged. Uh, that's right. By either party as well, so. Thank you, thank you, Councilman White, yes. Um, I'm just asking for me and and uh, Emory is in is in 4D and and 4B. They can be at both of those meetings. It's three meetings with ANC the ANC commissioners in their communities on engagement of this project. I think this is a simple yes. But but we have no funding for that project, which is what we I'm have. We have about. 25 million dollars as worded right now in the fiscal year 24 budget that says a library that services Brightwood Park. Manor Park and Shepherd Park. That's what it says. Y'all can't change it. It was sent down from the mayor to the council. I get it. <laughs> get it. Um, you know, council member, you know, just to, to accelerate this, I'm happy to speak to anybody, but, you know, I will be clear about where we are in terms of addressing perceived needs across the city, including, you know, in, in Manor Park. Um, there are communities all over the city that have requested services. And frankly, the data that we've got around the city with visits to libraries down 54% across the branch campus, you know, all this has to be weighed in a way that is not suggesting that we've got to be very thoughtful about what the future of the library is. Um, nobody cares about the data, apparently, but the data does mean something to me. I'm happy to talk to anybody you want me to talk to. But um, Okay, well, 4A, 4B, 4A, 4B, and 4D commissioners are listening, and you're saying you're happy to meet with them, so they will schedule the time to meet with you and their communities, um, and that will include, as Council Member Trayon White has, has um, uh, rightfully asked for, the, the um, young people of Emory Heights com uh, Community Center um, as testified to, so I, I, that's, that's where that is. I, yeah, that that's that's where that is. If that's a yes to to meeting with those commissioners in that community, that's that's what we would like. Um, I don't think anything can be done about sort of what the perception is at this point regarding Walter Reed. I just ask that as we move forward, that there's an honest, there's honest moving, there's an honest moving forward where we actually consider the input from our community. Um, and the BS, the language that came down from the mayor's budget is different from 23 to 24, and has and does state the language. Uh, for Brightwood Park, Manor Park, and Shepherd Park usage, that is what came down. So, I, I if you all are walking that back, that that's a that's a whole nother conversation. But I'm just going to ask my colleagues, Councilmember Trayon White, the members of this committee, um, as we work toward as we work in this budget, with, which with is what is in this budget, that we can do the work um, for an option for Juanita Thornton and for uh, to to modernize and renovate where it is, and for Kennedy Street. Uh, to have um, a library resource to service Brightwood Park and Manor Park. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, 
Director, was your, what was your answer to that about the meeting? Um, I missed that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to meet council member. Um, I do have misgivings of um, meeting without funding and also in a way that sort of doesn't correspond with the plan that we'd all-, all Yeah, but the reality is, Director, is that is that the sentiment has been since I've been the chair is that they are not there's not adequate communication and with the residents and so every meeting we that you I have anybody has don't doesn't mean we have funding at the time people just want to know that they feel heard and feel a part of the the process um and we're here and, and this is not just one just group of people you've been a part of these hearings as long as I have we just want to make sure people are heard and if you want to have that meeting um please let myself and my staff know because we would like to be in attendance so we can right. hear what's happening and, on the ground because and, this this even this right. hearing is a small fraction of the representation of the greater community yeah and you know to your point i know that there have been members of the public from ivy city who want to talk about a new library and uh uh, U Street and other parts of the city. So I think we have to temper expectations based on what we're looking at and the fact that we've done no recommendations around a future uh, facilities plan beyond what we've already got in our plan. I got that. Um, um, and, and real quick, I'm going to end with these few questions. Um, what are the total number of FTEs your agency uh, has for FY24? Um, 600 and 22.8 is the number that we're looking at. And what was it last year? This current fiscal year, six. 42.05. I know that we are have capital money to increase our recreation centers in the district in the next three to four years. Uh, how do we, huh? Libraries? I'm sorry, libraries. I appreciate that. I get them confused when I get in these long hearings. Um, how do we plan on getting these numbers back up to ensure adequate staff, not only for the facilities we have now, but also for the facilities in the future when we're, uh, you know, we're forced to cut staff? Um, you know, I don't know, council member, that's a good question. I know that we are, you know, in a economic downturn and, you know, I'm no economist, but that doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. As I mentioned, um, Library use is changing. Visits to physical libraries is changing. People's demands and expectations of the library are changing. I think these are all really important conversations that um, you know can take place over the course of a single hearing. You know, we haven't talked about use. We haven't talked about um, just in general use. We haven't talked about how behaviors have changed. Um, the things that we see every single day. I mean, this is a really big important part about how we. Uh, seek funding, whether for capital projects or for operating. Yeah. I think Council Member East Lewis George covered a number of the community concerns, so I won't go back on that. Um, so I'll do this. Let me see. Um, as a final note um, for this hearing, if anyone was able to testify, but would like to submit a written testimony to be included on official record. You can email your testimony to the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs, or RYA, at dccouncil.gov. And also, if you testify, we would still like to have a written copy of, of your testimony so that other members of this committee um, and even on the council can have it, um, because not all ward members or at-large members serve on this particular committee. and they would like to be in the know. So just for the official record for this hearing will close on Thursday, April the 20th, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. With no other business before this committee, 
The time is now 529 p.m. and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.